Planning Commission. By and large, we have one, two, three, four, five planning commissioners right here. Uh, we have at least two that are uh, uh, joining remote, and we have one that indicate that uh, we'll not be able to make it this evening. Uh, the first item on the agenda is uh, the review of the meeting minutes uh, uh, initially for the uh, March 24, 21, 19, 2021 uh, uh, Planning Commission. Uh, board members, uh, have you had a chance to take a look at those? Uh, are we, uh, do we have a motion to consider approving the minutes? I make a motion to approve. Motion by Scott support. Support by Scott to uh, approve the minutes from uh, March 24. Uh, uh, Tricia, could you call the roll, please? Mark? Yes. Steve? Yes. Terry? Yes. Tyler? Yes. Pat? Yes. Tom? Scott? Yes. Are you there, Tom? Okay, motion is passed uh, for the minutes of uh, March 24. Likewise, uh, March 17, we have uh, draft minutes from that meeting. Comments or questions or? Motion. I'll make a motion to approve those minutes as well. Support. Motion by Scott, supported by Tyler to approve the minutes of the March 17 Walker Planning Commission meeting. Uh, please call a roll, Tricia. Mark? Yes. Steve? Yes. Terry? Yes. Tyler? Yes. Matt? Yes. Tom? Yes. Scott, yes. I think you answered for Tom. Oh, did I? Don't I? know sorry. where Tom is. No, don't know. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. It's okay. But... All right. Uh, the minutes have been uh, uh, approved. Uh, as we move forward, uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, opportunity for general public comment. This is an opportunity to um, share any views that you have, questions or concerns regarding non-public hearing items. And issues not on the agenda. And again, on the agenda this evening is the uh, uh, re consideration of a rezoning and uh, uh, associated preliminary area site plan. Uh, but if you have question, uh, comments or questions about anything else, uh, uh, please, in, in terms of providing comment, where do people go? On the Zoom call, you. Ma'am, if you could yes. stop. Uh, how many people can you tell that are, are Zooming right now, residents? Can you see the number on that? The number is 41. 41? Thank you. All right, any other comment? Um, Jason, if you could, uh, likewise online, if, if you'd like to offer comment on a non-public uh, hearing item, uh, please uh, raise your virtual hand and uh, you'll be recognized. I don't see any hands raised. No hands raised? Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll move to the uh, main agenda item. Uh, this is case number 20 875. It's a public hearing and it relates to a request to rezone as well as a preliminary area uh, site plan of property uh, at uh, 3483 and 3840. 485 Lake Michigan Drive, uh, I think also known as the, the Lincoln Lawns uh, uh, Golf Course. Uh, rezone it from uh, its current uh, AA uh, agricultural classification to combination of commercial planned unit development, a high density residential planned unit development, and a low density residential planned unit development. Uh, in terms of the format this evening, uh, uh, we will first have the developer provide a, a presentation. And again, it's a public hearing. So we'll open the public hearing at that point. We'll take public comment. 
close the public hearing, and then we will uh, uh, give the uh, uh, an opportunity for the planning director to provide a, a, a an overview of her report on the project, and likewise the city engineer. At the end of that, uh, the planning commission will deliberate. And again, we've got two two questions before us: the rezoning and the preliminary area site plan. So uh, that's what's at hand this evening. And uh, as so, with the developer presentation, I believe there's a, a Rick Cavanaugh is a development team spokesperson. If you could, Rick, if you could uh, introduce the project and move forward, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, while we're loading up the screen, my name is Rick Cavanaugh. I'm president and founder of Stonely Companies. Uh, we're based out of Chicago area, but we do business all over the country, primarily focused in multifamily development uh, of a variety of different natures. I've been doing this for about 40 years all over the country, uh, have built in 39 cities and in 17 states, um, from Hawaii to New York and Miami to San Francisco. Uh, our focus in the business and is a long-term uh, investment in apartment buildings uh, that are rental, uh, very high quality and rental. I can take you to properties I built in 1984 and they're still looking really good and operating well and successful properties. So we have a long-term goal in mind here and a long-term investment thesis, not just as a builder. Um, thank you to the commission for hearing this tonight. It's been a little bit of a, a process in working through with the transition with the pandemic and being able to hold the public meeting. And thank you to the city for working with us. Uh, we've been patient and they've been very patient. And during that time, we've had some interesting dialogue and I think resolved many, many issues that were a concern that were brought up to us uh, earlier in the year in the uh, neighborhood meeting that we held on the Zoom call. <clears throat> and as well as several meetings that we've had since then uh, with the site plan review process. So what I'd like to do is take a few minutes to kind of walk you through our presentation and what we're planning on doing and why we're doing this and what our motivation is and, and how we see this happening uh, over the next three, four years as the site develops out. Um, for information, we did buy the property in January. We are the owners of the property. Uh, we were um, happy to, to close on the bowling alley. As you all know, that closed last year after the crisis hit and they had no intent of operating. And uh, it was made more sense for us as the owner of the property to proceed because we can speak with authority because we are the owner and we are looking out for the interest because we are now a, um, an, an investor and an owner and a partner um, in the city of Walker. So go ahead and advance one. So as I said, Stonely Companies is, is my company. I started it in 2008 after 30 years of working for other people and building their companies. Uh, our architect is Vocon out of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I, Vocon is basically leading our charge for this entire, you'll see in a little while of what we call Savannah Living. It's our single family or our one story rental product, which we're seeing a resurgence in around the country and is an alternative to your typical two, three story dense apartments. It's a very laid out open air feel with large open spaces, walking trails, and just more of a community feel rather than just a building where you've got people stacked up on top of each other. And our engineer is Kim Lee Horn, represented tonight by Drew Walker. And we have Rory on the traffic side, if there's any questions there. Uh, here with me tonight is Anthony Rodriguez, who's my development manager, uh, who's been pursuing and working on this project for about a year and three months. Uh, as a small background information, we, we basically struck a deal with AMF in October of 2019 to buy the property. And we had a contract and they didn't sign it until February 28th of 2020, which as we all know was right before um, the COVID crisis hit and kind of stalled some of the planning process and some of the communication we were able to have. Uh, but we kept that contract alive throughout the year as we were working on our planning. And then we closed on the land in January as they were getting very impatient and a uh, very non-interested landowner for the property. So we were happy to do that. It was a great transaction. They were good to work with, but it was obvious that they were a disinterested um, landowner here in the city of Walker. 
Go ahead. Uh, just as a quick, um, I had said we've, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years. I've been involved in over 43,000 units of both apartments and condominiums around the country uh, since 1983. And this will show you everywhere that we're at. Um, currently, we're building in St. Paul, Minnesota, Cleveland, Ohio, and Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Uh, we own properties in Chicago. We own this property. We own a property in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That'll be a similar product. Um, we currently own four properties in Texas uh, and three properties out in Colorado. Uh, but you can see where we've worked, mostly Sunbelt over the time, because for the most part, the apartment business is in the southern part of the country. It's a much more prevalent use to have apartments in multifamily residential in the southern part of the country. The northern part of the country is not quite as growing as fast, so therefore doesn't have as much demand. But we have certainly been, um, if actually New York's not shown here, but I had something in New York and Pittsburgh and Minnesota and, and across the country. So when it comes down to understanding what renters want, uh, what housing needs are, what is the product that people want to have who are going to live here? Um, we have a pretty good, our group has a pretty good understanding of servicing and meeting those needs and building product that is going to stand the test of time uh, on a quality and investment basis. Go ahead. Um, just a couple of quick pictures of projects we've done just in the last couple of years, about last four years. Um, we have everything from high rises with one uptown and one Arlington. One uptown is in Dallas, Texas. One Arlington's in Arlington Heights, Illinois. Uh, we have built several three and four story buildings. We're under construction in the middle in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, that's gonna be opening up in July of this year. And on the right, which you can't quite see is the building that Vocon developed for us in Cleveland. They're a phenomenal architect. I've really enjoyed working with them and great architects deserve to have more work. And, and this has been a great iterative process with them. Well, next slide. So the site we're obviously we're talking about is Lincoln Country Club is 105 acres. Um, to the south is where the bowling alley and the parking lot is. And then the golf course is laid out. And if any of you saw us, we were driving around in the truck today on the golf course. And we had several golfers out there today as well that were still using the course, um, which we didn't kick off. We were, that's fine if they want to go out and hit balls. Um, no, we are not keeping the golf course. We're not keeping the, the golf course. As, as, as an economic fact, the only year that AMF made money on the golf course was last year. For the last, I think they bought it 12 or 14 years ago when they bought the bowling alley out of foreclosure. And then they got the golf course with it and they operated. And they typically lost about $200,000 a year on the golf course. But last year was the first profitable year as it was for the golf business all over the country because everyone was playing golf and not having to work as much or travel downtown as much. So uh, that was a good year, but they had made the decision in the summer to close the golf course in October and cease the operation. So we knew that that was not an option to keep the golf course operating. And, and it is, it need, even if it was still open, it needs a lot of work because it was not very well maintained over the last few years. It's nice and it's an interesting property, but there are so many dead trees and so many bad limbs and so many potholes and the drainage that's so along uh, Lake Michigan drive and throughout the property is is congested it's overrun it's silty it needs to be cleaned up the property needs to look a lot better than it has been and it's not an that's not a criticism it's just an observation of what's there today so as you can see the property is kind of an l-shaped property comes up over towards the bike trail on that side and comes down and when you look at it let's go to the next slide thank you trisha oh whoops let me go back to the one before okay when you look at this, there are, there are two areas that are, have in, you know, wetlands and environmental concerns. One is the lower right-hand side. And if you walk there now, even I got stuck in the truck down driving near the par three today, it has the water and all the mud down there. Uh, next time I'm gonna get a four wheel drive when I get a truck, but um, we did go out to that green and you can see there's water down. There's the picture from last year. And then there's also some kind of really low quality wetlands up in the north west corner of the site. So as we look at this piece of property, it's too big to do what we, just what we wanted to do. That would take a long time to do it. And it's not necessarily the best way to approach the planning for the site. 
right? And when you look at the planning and how that site sits within the community and where it, with Lake Michigan Drive and the house and the single family to the north and to the west, and then the apartments to the east, um, it, it works better to have a transitionary type of planning, which is how we've approached it. Um, we originally submitted this as a mixed PUD, uh, but then in working with the city staff, uh, it was recommended that we break it into three PUDs with three separate zoning classifications, which is an iterative process that we got to and was worked really well. Now we have the single family to the north, which basically buffers and is consistent with the uses that are around there. We have the multifamily in the middle at a low density, and then along Lake Michigan Drive where the bowling alley and the parking lot just becomes a bit commercial, repurposed for smaller lot users, not for having a big box or our other users. So go ahead. So what is the concept behind this? Why are we interested in it? Why are we here? Um, number one, our primary driver, as I said, is we have our new concept. I've been doing apartments for a long time. I build high rises and low rises and mid rises. And right now I think that the, with construction costs escalating as much as they are, um, which is forcing rents and everything else, as well as property taxes and all the other influences that come back to us as the investor and builder the, and, and money behind the partner or the property. Um, we believe that this one story product, which is a low density, low impact, big open space product is going to be more successful, will be allowed to be offered um, from a rental basis at a much more reasonable pricing, right? If you invest $250,000 in a three-story apartment building, you have to earn a certain return and the rents will go up. If you build it for $150,000 to $200,000 as a lower density, then, you can, then your rents don't need to be as high to be, at least meet your minimum returns that investors and banks want to see when they're financing these. Um, but we also believe that there's a resurgence and a growth in, if you go to other states that have seen this over the last five to seven years, Arizona, Nevada, Columbus, Ohio, has seen a bunch. Um, up towards Cleveland, there's been some. There's a company here in Grand Rapids uh, that has built two properties called Redwoods. If anyone's ever seen those, those are one story attached garage product. Um, they've built 90 of these in the last six years all in the Midwest, all Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, um, and Pennsylvania. And now they're expanding out and keeping on growing. So it's, in, it's consistent with what they're doing, but we feel that our design and the, the concept we have is a little bit different and a little bit better, but that's just our opinion. And you know, as developers, we always are trying to look for ways to create our little niche in the marketplace to make it work. And I think with our product, uh, we've come up with a very interesting, afford, you know, relatively affordable in the marketplace, much more than higher density apartments. And also it's a lower impact to the neighborhood and the utilities. Second thing, the current site, as I said, was 105 acres um, with the surrounding uses. And that was something that we took into consideration early on as to how to solve for the, the density and the uses within the site. Um, our overall density is much less than even the master plan considers uh, at 200, approximately 280 units on the site versus 432 or 436 that the master plan suggests in its layout. Um, we have a lower density than that. That's okay. Um, we did actually buy the land pretty well. AMF was in distress. Um, still wasn't cheap, but it wasn't a very high priced, highly um, in demand uh, land that caused the prices to escalate. We were able to do that at a time that it hadn't quite gotten as crazy as it is today when you're looking at single family lots and, and all the prices have escalated so much all across the country. Um, being the larger, the, the larger site, it's taken some time because it's an iterative process and working with the city, the engineers, with Grand Rapids, and, and just looking at transportation and flow and the the public roads and all the other things. It took a while to put this together and we've been, we've listened. We had the neighborhood meeting um, several months ago. We listened to what the comments were. We responded to those. The city was very cognizant of some of those comments. And I think our plan that we've come up with has dealt with most of those concerns. Other than we want a golf course, um, we have dealt with virtually all the planning issues and traffic and utility issues that have been 
brought to us, we've solved for in this plan, which is a which is a good solution for the the time and the effort that we've had. Um, as I said, the the old Bolero site, AMF Brunswick, um, was closed and was not going to be opening again. And the other thing is, you know, when we look at it, why Grand Rapids for us? Well, Grand Rapids, Walker, um, the surrounding communities here have been a very stable and successful housing market over time. From the apartment business standpoint, you've, there has always been higher occupancies, which is one of the tests of how the market's doing. Um, if you go to Southern cities, sometimes when times are tough, their occupancy will go from 95% to 85% and you have volatility. Here has always been in the mid to high 90s. And that is a stable thing from an investor, from a uh, capital commitment, from just a long-term horizon. That's something that motivates us. Um, the other thing is basically where this property is on Lake Michigan Drive and within the area and its access to everything is a very, it's a very highly trafficked site. And um, I think as I'll get into in a couple of minutes, one of the solutions and one of the recommendations in the traffic study is to add a light at our new spine road in Lake Michigan, which will allow access from Lincoln Lawns to come out through a light to make a left-hand turn. And I made three left-hand turns off the site today in the traffic. And it's not a very pleasant thing to have to dodge and go really quick. So I think to be able to provide something that allows better access, quality timing and, and a safe, safer traffic movement is an important part of what we've committed to on the plan. Next slide. So what, what's our timing? What's gonna happen? Well, obviously last year put a, put a little bit of a stop on a lot of processing. Um, right now, we're here tonight on April 14th, thank goodness. And if, if we do get a positive recommendation from the plan commission, um, we would then move on to the city commission and come back to you again for a preliminary site plan. At least that's the discussion is that the complexity of our preliminary site plan is such that really getting the zoning in process was the recommendation of the city and we concurred. And then to address the site plan pretty quickly thereafter, it is definitely our goal to start construction on the road this summer. We'd like to get it done before the fall. Um, best time of the year to build. Um, it's going to have a road with a lot of utilities and a lot of impacts and some earthwork to it. Um, we would like, and we have to get that done before we can even start work on the multifamily or the single family or the commercial site. So our goal is to get those. We basically have the plans done, um, ready to submit for permits. Uh, we've met with all the agencies in the area that are impacted by that and have gotten base, uh, have gotten concurrence that what we're proposing is reasonable, rational, and defensible, and that all the utilities and, and transportation impacts and everything else, stormwater impacts, are all being addressed and solved and or made better by our plan. So we would like to start construction on the road um, sometime summer, this mid this summer. Um, it's probably a three month process to build that road and have it ready, the public road that serve, goes through the commercial and the residential or the multifamily and gets to the residential. The residential public roads, um, which just as a clarification in the package sent to you was talked about being private on the north half. Actually, the roads in the single family site would be public roads um, with public services and public utilities in there, and we would turn those over. Those will be built when the single family development occurs. Um, that's not something that we're going to do because um, we're, we're not single family builders. Maybe we should be given the way the market is so strong. But uh, that's not something I've done a lot of, and that's not really my uh, best use. So we'll deliver the road to their site, and then we have a couple of builders that we've been negotiating with that are very interested in building um, um, some very nice quality uh, mid-sized homes on the site because the lots are mid-sized lots uh, from a standpoint. And um, I think that'll come together really quickly. But the first step before anyone really wants to talk to me about buying the lots or building homes there is we need to have the zoning in place, which is why we've gotten to this position to say, if we can get the zoning and we know that at least that is the use, then we can deal with the site plan and the platting concerns and all the other next steps in there. And as soon as we get the road completed, we will start and go as fast as we can on the multifamily. My goal is to try to have um, the first apartments ready for occupancy sometime early next summer. Um, which is a fast building process, but 
The sooner I build it, the better because construction prices are going up three to 5% every month right now um, with all the um, crazy things that are happening with concrete, wood, steel, drywall mud, steel studs, every, every facet of construction is just is, is out of sync because of the um, logistical issues that are going on in the post COVID crisis in construction business. Go ahead, Trisha. So let's see here. Somehow the colors didn't come through on here, but as, as I had said, we're asking for three different zonings. Uh, the RPUD um, one on the north, let's call it third of the property, um, 30 acres. RPUD two, which is low density multifamily, it says four to eight. I believe we're just around six units to the acre, which is pretty low density in typically in our business in the center portion. And then down along this side of the spine road into the south is a CPUD that would have a C1 and an ORD um, uses that are allowed within that. Uh, right now, uh, we had had some original contacts with users uh, that had wanted office buildings and possibly banking or something like that on those sites. Again, everybody's waiting for the zoning before they really want to say how they want to use it. So we've as we've looked at this plan, we've come up with and said, well, how would, you know, how would I do it if I was building these office buildings? And we came up with a plan with uh, five outlots, but I don't know what they're gonna be. I mean, if someone comes in and wants to build a medical office building and it's 15,000 feet instead of 12 and needs some density move from somewhere else, that is certainly is something that'll have to be handled through the process, but is allowable under that zoning within that district. So we know what the maximum percentage of square footage is in that entire Southern part, but how that gets worked out and whether there's a 40,000 foot building or three 12,000 foot buildings, that's the market's gonna decide that when we have users that are gonna come in. Um, I think that that will probably, that um, approach to us from the users will happen later this summer, this fall, um, because I really wanna get the road going we tear down the bowling alley in mid to late June, and it'll just change the character and what people see, right? Because people see what's there today and they don't imagine it, and they have to kind of see the progress and what happens as you start to develop out the site. Next slide. Um, here, just as a, as a quick addressing, and, and Drew can get into this more if we have some questions or need to understand, but I think the utility plan that we've come up with on the site is very efficient. It's very consistent with the surrounding um, availability of sewer water and stormwater and electric and cable and, and internet. Uh, as you can see, the commercial pretty much feeds off of Lake Michigan Drive. The multifamily feeds off of Lincoln Lawns to existing manholes that exist in there that have enough capacity to do this. And then we have a link to the single family site so that we can meet the two points of in uh, for water and uh, coming in for fire hydrants and everything else, right? You always want two points of supply coming in in the, in the residential side. So there is a water tap that happens up to the north uh, off of Maple Row, feeds in through the single family and connects back through the multifamily, which then ties back over to Lincoln Lawns. So that will create water that comes from two separate distinct um, water supplies uh, that can service the property. The sanitary supply, as you can see, the single family flows to the north and the sanitary that's up in the, up on Maple Row, the multifamily feeds into Lincoln Lawns and the commercial feeds to the sanitary right on Lake Michigan on basically on the southeast, or southwest corner of the property. Next slide. So one of the other things that's come up is, you know, the single family, um, we're, we're complying with the current code which is 90 foot lots. Uh, they're about 100 and I think 132 deep. Um, and they create buildable areas uh, from my discussions with the single family home builders that are very interested in this is you're probably talking about somewhere between 1800 to 3000 square foot homes. It might be a little bit more in certain things. There are certainly some interesting lots on this property um, that have walkout features where you can have a basement that because of the slope getting back to there. And I think that'll be their challenge is to, you know, figure out exactly what house is. It's not intended to be a track home. Um, developments intended to be a series of single family homes, very similar to the community to the north. Um, uh, with, and, and the size, I think, and the scope and the lot coverage 
of what you have on uh, up in the northern sub subdivision here. So we showed a little bit about what happens because when you look at the plan on the north third with just the boxes, that looks like a very big dense thing. It's really not when you look at how the houses would feed in the driveways and what the backyards would be. There's plenty, there, it's, there's ample size on quarter acre lots here to be able to develop really nice homes. Um, pricing is anyone's guess. I mean, just look at what's happening just to the west here and what's happening in the area and prices. You know, starter homes are in the four to $500,000 range, which is befuddling, but that's what the market is today um, for the homes that are being built. From this plan, you can see, I had mentioned the one area down to the southeast, which is 15 acres of pretty low lying, um, low grade wetlands. Um, we are maintaining that. We're really not touching it. I do think we need to clean it up a lot after driving around and seeing all the junk that they've cut and thrown in the bushes over there. Uh, so that our intent is for that area to be a public. Um, we, well, we don't have any agreement. We've discussed this, but it's not anywhere final being done. Our goal would, because we provided a parking lot there on the, on the road, you look at it right here and we're building two detention ponds and then we have a lot of natural water that's at existing lakes and to improve that and clean it up is the possibility of that becoming a public park at some point or even a private park and having walking trails that will access through there. You can park, um, we'll have the, I would say the dozen people I saw walking their dogs in the property today, will still have 15 acres that they go and take and walk their dogs around in, in a somewhat public uh, location. And it does service off of the stoplight that'll be down on Lake Michigan Drive. And then on the west side of the commercial and the multifamily, that's also a low area. If you go out there now, there's water standing down on what used to be the fairway of that hole along Lincoln Lawns. Um, I called it a goose wash because there were several geese in there taking their, taking their bass today. But uh, our goal is for that to become a buffer and a detention and a, and a reserved area to provide a distance buffer, a view buffer, and an access buffer to Lincoln Lawns to what's happening in the commercial and the multifamily. And you can see from the green highlights here how much open space that ends up being. It's a it's a more um, it's a, it's a larger offering to that. But the with the low density we have on the site, that's a good thing. We can accomplish that. And then up to the northwest of the site, you'll see up there even though there's three golf holes that kind of go back through those trees, that's been determined to be wetlands um, that drains off to that ditch that runs along the bike trail. Um, so we're dedicating that area, it's about nine acres to open space. And we'll be able to put our detention pond up there for all the single family. And it'll also serve as an area to provide water filtration because the, the way the creek and the ditches run up that area, it kind of passes through there and then goes to the ditch along the bike trail, which then goes down to Lake Michigan Avenue for the direction of where the stormwater goes. And then we've created also, because there are trees, I would say that they're probably medium to low grade quality trees in most instances along the Northern property and the Eastern property border. Um, there still is a dense stand of trees and there is enough distance there between our property line and where our buildable area is to provide a buffer to the single family, it's immediate to our east, which is in Grand Rapids or to the homes to the north. And we've offered as part of the discussion to have a kind of a no cut, no clearing. Um, there are a lot of dead trees in there that probably need to be cleared at some point in time, but there are still enough nice trees and you can see what's budding now uh, to understand that that area will be, will provide a nice buffer zone between the neighborhoods of the north and the single family, uh, the RPUD one. Okay, next one. Uh, this gives you a little bit idea. It's a little closer up on the RPUD one. You see the wet the areas to the west that are the open space. Uh, there's another detention pond. Uh, one of the things that is that we are proposing um, as we work through transportation issues with the city and the local area is that Maple right now Marlboro comes and turns down Lincoln, Lincoln Lawns, and there's a big curve there. Is actually to uh, reorient that because the, those are public streets inside the single family. We, they will be built as public streets and have the utilities and everything just to, along, along to the standards that are there. But from a fire truck access and from a, with cul-de-sacs on there, it's better to have two points of access. Um, and so we've worked with the, with the city closely to come up with an orientation that works. 
Um, this is pretty low impact and, a, and a, I think a good improvement for what that intersection will be. It does not connect to the north. Uh, one of the things we heard um, in the neighborhood meeting and before and after in our uh, discussions with residents and people who have contacted us is that they're concerned that if this was connected, there'd be a traffic flow that comes down. Um, we understand that. We have offered, um, because we got to connect the sanitary and the water through that to just have a public right of way. But at the end of the day, our proposal is not to build that connection um, based on some of the feedback we've had. That is a decision that really ends up becoming a city county um, MDOT type of discussion at the end of the day. But we're providing um, the possibility, but we're also providing the area to get the utilities up there because they would connect to the utilities that exist right at the end of Maple Row at this time. So there is a right of way there so that the city controls the sanitary and the water and um, whatever happens in that connection between the two. So that is one thing I know we've had a lot of different comments some people didn't understand, but our proposal is to have everything accessed primarily off of our spine road. I haven't come up with a name for the spine road yet, but uh, that goes down with the stoplight at Lake Michigan with the secondary access off of Lincoln Lawns, um, which would be there primarily for public safety, uh, for access and for secondary access, you know, fire trucks come in, they got to turn around and go out. It's a much better thing to have two points of access, just like you have two points of access for the water lines that are being installed. Okay, next one, Tricia. Thank you. All right, the multifamily portion. Um, as you can see, we're proposing the multifamily, which is, you know, built, controlled, invested by us also would be responsible for now for the um, 15 acre open space to the Southeast, um, east of the Spine Road, as well as the detention and the buffer all the way along Lincoln Lawns. And part of that concern was that we, as in our discussions with the city and some of the neighbors, is what happens if the office buildings, if you do have office buildings, don't take care of it, don't, aren't responsible for maintaining the detention pond, for doing things that are necessary to keep that buffer and that, um, feel of what we're trying to create there, what would happen with that if there, you have a commercial organization or a series of commercial organizations? So we said, that's fine. We're kind of the master developer anyway, and it's our responsibility to make sure that those areas are maintained, that they're mown, that, they're, that the drains are cleaned out, and that everything's working according to that. And so right now, the RPUD2 zoning incorporates all of that land that surrounds the commercial even though some of the detention from single family and some of the detention from the commercial flows into our site and then out the county drain, we're gonna take the responsibility for maintaining those in the process where the detention ponds are. Okay, next one. So to give you some ideas um, of what it is we're proposing, and this is by no means final because it's an iterative process, we go through the um, thing, but this gives you a good idea of what we've tried to design. Uh, with Vocon, and this is something that we're applying in multiple cities across the country. We have sites in Kenosha, we have sites in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Buckeye, Arizona, Palm Coast, Florida, uh, Shirts, Texas, that we're going to deploy a similar product on. And our, our goal is to have something that is so good that we just can repeat it again and again and not have to reinvent it every time, which is what you do a lot of times on two and three story buildings, because everything is different. You always have to kind of think through and redo it. Um, our branding uh, is Savannah Living. Uh, Savannah is a, a great town, although there's 17 Savannahs in the United States. Everyone thinks about Georgia, but there's one in Illinois, there's one in Texas, there's one in Montana. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a, it's a, intended to be fields with mature trees that are saved, um, very nice landscaping, rolling terrains. That's kind of the image that we want to create with our one-story buildings. They're very low impact buildings from a visual nature. If you look and see one story houses versus two story houses or three story apartments, it's a much lower impact visually. And given the way that the site works and the, and the, and the rolling nature of the site, much of the site is not gonna be able to be seen from driving around. It's, it's more contained because it's lower towards the middle and somewhat of a ball. But this gives you an idea. Um, what we're doing with our product is we're providing a two story attached garage whether it's a one bedroom, a two bedroom, or a three bedroom unit with a driveway. So effectively, there's four parking spots for every unit. 
And I don't know if you can go anywhere and find a one bedroom apartment that has, you know, two car garage attached to it. In fact, I'm not aware of anywhere that has those. So, but to us, to me, that's important because that means I'm going to have people moving in here. They're going to want to be here for three, four, five years, not for one year, like happens a lot of times in transit scene apartments. We're going to, there's going to be more families. There's going to be a little bit more of a community atmosphere. That's what we're trying to solve for. And I think that the image of Savannah living is, um, this will be the Savannah at Walker. Um, in Kenosha, we have Savannah at Pike Creek. In Des Moines, it's Savannah at Ankeny. And so the branding becomes consistent because my goal is to do 25 or 30 of these over the next five years around the country, or maybe more. Um, and this is one of the first sites. And I think given the way the market is, this is, this is an excellent location to be able to help deliver a brand. Um, this gives you an Im image here. We've got a couple more just from the design impact. Uh, uh, our intent is to have some variation in colors within the buildings and within the site, not a whole bunch. So it looks um, mixed up but to have not just one color tone, but to have a little bit of play in different colors, just like there's different color houses in every neighborhood. Go ahead. This will give you an idea of what the, on the public side of this, which is the, as people will enter in through the garage and through their front door, this is off their back door, they'll have patios. It'll connect the sidewalks. There'll be walking paths. There'll be gazebos. There'll be bocce ball courts. There'll be activity behind your unit, not just a drainage ditch and a patio. Um, and that's part of what our feeling is that we're creating enough distance between the buildings. We're creating a space. We're saving some trees by doing this. And by the time we do the landscaping, it'll create a very nice out your back door feel for this product that people will be able to go out the back and then be able to walk their dogs and, and take a walk and get to the bike trail and do other things. So this kind of gives you an idea of what the back of the building looks like. Um, you'll see here, we have oversized windows. We have eight foot sliders. We have vaulted ceilings stainless steel appliances, granite or quartz countertops. It's the latest and greatest of what rental housing allows for and needs in this day and age. It's not cheap stuff. Um, yet at the same time, it's a lower impact and a little easier to build and a little faster to be able to build this. Go ahead. So the key design concepts, I'll go real quick because I've talked enough about it, but it's all four, six and eight unit buildings. There's no 24, 36 unit buildings. It's all small impact on that. Density is much lower than typical. Every unit has an attached two-car garage. Um, we have generous open space throughout with the walking areas, the resting path, or the, and the paths. And then you connect to the open spaces we have here, and it creates a much bigger community um, walking um, feel for the people that will live here. Obviously, as I said earlier, the cost is a little bit lower to build these, um, which, in my opinion, allows us to not have to charge as much in rent in order to meet what are the needs for solving for the debt and equity side of this? Um, we have all, our, our amenities are just barely listed here. They go a lot further than this. And if you look at other product that I built all over the country, you'll see that it's some of the highest quality of properties within the sub markets that we built. I'm very focused on that. I am a visionary and not, I'm not visionary. I, I, my vision is to create the product that people look at and say, that's the best rental property in the marketplace and today and in five years and in 10 years. And I'm proud to point to the stuff that we've done before, but I'm very focused on the dimensions of laundry rooms and double sinks and bathrooms and large closets with alpha storage systems. So people look at it and say that most people don't provide that. That's what we do. Um, we do have a mix of one, two and three bedrooms, which, which we think aligns with what the renter demand will be, right? You're always predicting uh, this is two years from now. Do I need one bedrooms? Do I need three bedrooms? Do I need two bedrooms? What is the marketplace? That's the gamble that we play as a developer. Um, but I think with our unit mix and what we're providing is pretty much in line with what I think we'll, we'll need here. Our buildings, because they're one story and the way that we build them are much lower maintenance. We have more efficient mechanical systems, lower cost um, LED lights throughout, uh, lower cost heating systems so that residents don't have to pay as much in utilities as you might in an older building. Uh, that you'd be available. And I think that our development schedule allow for units in the summer of 2020. Next one. These are, I, I'm not a fan of two dimensional renderings because it's hard to see. Um, we're developing the isometrics of these so we can see those a little bit better, but this does give you an idea of what the scale is. Um, there are some ins and outs to the buildings that it's hard to tell from here, but the buildings do have a little bit of motion as well as because the site has got some grade changes, we will have some steps in the building 
So you'll have buildings that are broken in the middle by two or three feet to have a change in the foundation, uh, which creates character within the building. And this, the front one, I'll show you four real quickly, but um, this gives you an idea of what a one bedroom unit is. Very large one bedrooms in the apartment world. These are about 12 by 13 feet. Generally they're 10 to 11 feet. The double sinks in the bathroom, showers, large closets, laundry facility, double car garage, and then a huge living area with an open kitchen with an island so that people who live there, they walk in their kitchen, they see out their window out to the green space. It's not closed in, it's not dark, it's not dense. So this is the one bedroom, which is we call the rear entry, which is only in the buildings that are right off the main road that are back to back. And those are, so the front door is back around the back. So the visitors who park can come right to the front door along the site plan versus coming in the driveway. And that's just on the six buildings that are right along the spine road that are perpendicular to the spine road. All the other buildings will be front door loaded access, which the next one we'll show you is, kind of gives you a little idea of how that changes on the floor plan layout here. One more, yep, sorry, that's okay. Here now the front door is here instead of off the back. Now you have a patio. Everything else is pretty consistent. Again, larger dimensions that we see. 900 square foot one bedrooms are very rare except from 1970s product. I mean, it, it, over time, square footage got smaller and now they're getting, you know, now they're getting a little bit bigger again. But it's also part of the plan of what we want for the open space and the vaulted ceilings and what we think we can afford to build for what we anticipate people to be willing to pay for. The next one, Trisha, thank you. This will give you an idea of the two bedrooms. I'm still working on this a little bit. Um, I think these should be hip roofs and you know the gables, but it shows a mix of stone materials, uh, siding, uh, shaker siding up in the gables with little uh, some nice detailing up there. And again, high quality glass windows. Using, you know, we were doing Pella in St. Uh, Minnesota. We're using um, Insight in Cleveland, which are really super quality windows. That's a really important part. Windows leak and are, create a lot of a utility costs for people. So if you provide a better window system and upgrade a little bit, it really cuts the utility costs in the units. Okay, the next one. And this, that's an all two bedroom building. This gives you an idea. It's all two bedrooms in the middle, and then we have a three bedroom on the end. Because with the bedrooms, you need windows. And so the only way you can provide three bedrooms in a row is to have windows on the side of the building. These also access from the side. So the front door is through the side of the unit and comes in and opens up. And again, when you look at the, sea, the plans, you know, very large three bedrooms, you've got, you know, island kitchens with ample storage, ample cabinets, pantry cabinets, um, microwaves, uh, exhaust to the outside for the stoves and the cooktops. It's really a high quality of, of what a renter would expect. Okay, next one. And the three bedrooms are as large as 1,600 square feet, which is, you know, basically a small single family home at 1,600 square feet. Real quickly, why in the single family rental? That's what they kind of call the business in the, in the real estate world. Um, renting has become much more common. I don't know if you watched over the years, but after the financial crisis of 2009 and 10, single family ownership was at 70% in 2008. And that went down to about 63% last year around the country, which means 7% of the population, if you have 140 million households in the country, that means that there was about 12 million households that switched from single family to renter because of the economic, the financial crisis back in the late in the prior decade. Now that transition is kind of stabilizing and because of the impact of millennials and Gen Z and people selling their houses and retiring and moving, you still see a very larger demand and that's gonna flatten out and be pretty much consistent. It sat from 1945 until 2002 at 64% sales and 36% rentals. That way, I mean, if you look at the standard, all the years was flat until you came to the big housing boom that happened in the early 2000s and it went crashing down right after 2008 happened. So we see that the housing demand is gonna be 36% rental and 64% single family nationwide. Every market's gonna change a little bit, but that is pretty much a statistic that's gonna stand. Um, interesting, um, some, some of the data that we have, the number of married couples with children that own homes has fallen 
by uh, 2.4 million homes in the last, since 2004, in the last 18 years. They're moving into apartments, the kids, the school districts, whatever else it is, there seems to be a shift. It's not just kids don't belong just in homes, they also occupy apartments. So you have to build them so that they can have kids, they can have separate bedrooms, they can have separate bathrooms, you need to meet that demand. Families with children now make a larger share of percenter households than owner households, 29 to 26. Interesting statistics, you never would think, but that does exist, so you have to keep that in mind. Housing costs have risen, it says here, 80% since what year was that? From 2000, and, well, I, I can't see on the side, but, and, and they, just since January 1st of last year, pre-COVID, the, the housing costs nationwide have risen 15%. I mean, that's, it's great if you own a house and you wanna sell it, it's expensive if you're gonna buy, you move in there. And that, as housing houses go up, as housing prices continue to go up, renting demand goes up, right? Because that becomes an alternative. And what happened in the financial crisis is you used to be able to buy a house with 5% down and finance the rest. And then for years, it was 20% down with 80% financing. Now it's starting to shift again to get a little bit more aggressive on the financing, which worries you in the long run. But right now um, to be able to buy a house for $400,000 and you got to come up with $80,000 as a deposit, that's a challenge. For a lot of people, and especially given the economic challenge that we have here. And then Gen Z, which are the kids coming out of college now, which followed the millennials, um, they're a key driver for rental demand. Also, you have to keep that in mind. Doesn't mean that your property is all full of 21 year olds and 22 year olds, but that is a larger share of the rental demand because they don't want to live with their parents anymore, which is great. If you're a parent having kids coming out of college, if they decide to go and set off in the old world, it's kind of fun to have. Next share, next slide. Okay, not working. All right, we're almost done. Okay, so last thing is the commercial. Again, these are representative of what we think is going to happen. That's going to depend on user demand. But the one thing I wanted to bring up that's of a concern that we addressed that I think is a important thing to keep in mind and probably in, in a good resolution for what this plan allows us to do because right now Lincoln Lawns comes down to here and Sunset Hills is here. And one of the concerns is the opposing left turn traffic that happens with that. And it's something that we heard a lot about in the resident discussions that that is a dangerous situation. You're coming over the hill as you go by this property, you're coming down the hill and you have two left turns coming in that are opposing. And it creates a little bit of, I, I, I know from here it creates chaos from here. It's also not that easy. I did that two or three times today. And, and over the last several months. So what we propose in looking at what the solution might be, since we have this corner of the property is rather than us taking another commercial parcel, which could be a, some building or some other outlot use for an acre and a half, we suggested, and I think um, in, in discussions, we evolved in the design with the city to have Lincoln Lawns line up with Sunset Hills and then it'll come up and create a nice gentle entry to the neighborhood, um, kind of stops the cut throughs. The, there are three homes that are south of that roundabout or whatever that intersection becomes. We've used the roundabout because that's kind of the popular planning design in our discussions, but um, that's something that needs to work out with city engineering. But when you come down here and do this, these three homes need access. So the idea is to create a cul-de-sac and they could easily access that and come back up. And then if residents who are coming down want to make a left turn, they can easily go across the public road here and here in the light would be at the corner of the new road in Lake Michigan. I think the plant, the book that was sent to you said it was at Lincoln Lawns in Lake Michigan, but really the majority of the demand, when you look at the density that we have in the homes and the apartments and the commercial, the majority of that demand is gonna to wanna to go to, the, to what would be the east side of that hill, not to the west side. So the, this, and because the distance from here to the next stoplight here and the distance here is about equal distance at this point versus cramming it closer and having a short cycle on the stoplight cycle. So the traffic study, which is a thousand pages in length, um, suggested it's there. We've talked with MDOT um, in submitting some of these things to them and they agree that that's the best solution is to have that there and to provide that access road, which we didn't have originally. We didn't have this access road 
But as we designed this new link, we decided, you know, we said it's better if the residents, if they want to take a left turn, can get to a left turn lane through a controlled light at the intersection. Um, I think that was probably the largest change to the plan from what we submitted six months ago that we worked out and gone through. And I think it makes a lot of sense and it'll provide a, uh, a much better access control, not only for us, but for the entire neighborhood of Lincoln Lawns to the west of us. Okay, this, you know, this artist indication of what it is, but um, Waterford Village is what we have um, named. Waterford is our property company, it's our identity we use in a lot of our apartments around the country. Um, so Waterford Village was the name for the entire subdivision. Savannah would be the name of the multifamily, um, the commercial and the residential. The residential have to decide what it wants to call itself, but if it's in a master plan community like this on 105 acres, it needs an identity and we've proposed having signage along Lake Michigan that allows for that identity for people to get in. And then you'd have the stoplight there, which would have both a right turn out and a left turn. And as well as um, a wider lane coming in and right a right hand in going westbound on Lake Michigan and a right hand acceleration lane going westbound. Because that is, I know we've, if you come out of the bowling alley and turn right on Lake Michigan, you got to step on it to because people are coming at 50, 60 miles an hour westbound on Lake Michigan at that point, and they come up on you really quick. So having the acceleration lane, I think, is a really important feature. Okay. All right. So um, most of these I've already talked about. We can look at them for a couple minutes, but you know we've tried to we've listened. I think we've addressed almost every concern we have, other than the fact that. We don't want this to be anything but a golf course. I understand that, I appreciate that, but it's the golf course is tired and, and under, it's, it just has not been well kept up. And this is a higher, this is a better use for the property. And what I think will be more um, uh, in working with what City of Walker wants to do and with what the master plan applies. Uh, we've done connectivity. Uh, we're gonna preserve certain of the old trees. We're marking them today, driving around looking at all the trees. Most of them are really are diseased and with splits in the bark or things like that. Um, but the ones that we have, we have some beautiful oaks on the property and our intent is to save those. We've shown them on the site plan, how we're saving those trees. Um, we're gonna trim them up because they're right now, they're way overgrown. They have too many limbs coming off. We want them to look like beautiful trees, not like something that hasn't been maintained for 20 years. Um, obviously the realignment, the new access road that we have to build, um, the traffic signal that we have. And uh, the other thing that we just got last week is in working with the city and with Grand Rapids because the um, uh, sanitary sewer flow was a question as to whether there was a choke point down where it goes under Lake Michigan over where the Lincoln Lawns Road is or, or Sunset Hills is. And Grand Rapids went and did a flow test and stated that it, this was sufficient, that our demand that we are gonna create along with the existing demand would be able to be met with the existing piping going under so we don't have to redo any of the sanitary sewer that goes under Lake Michigan, which is a good thing because that's not an easy project. Next one. Uh, just the overall site plan. I just brought this up as the closing slide. Um, I think I've talked enough. Hopefully I've got a little bit of character of what we're trying to do here. Um, we're very invested in this. We're always available. Um, I think we're very rational people. I wanna build a great product here, something that you all can be proud of, that you all are happy to live next to, and that the city is generates the revenue that the city needs and does it in a very uh, efficient and smart and um, cost-effective nature to create this development. 105 acres is a lot of land. And uh, to do it right and to have it where it's compatible and where people are happy when you're done, that's really what my goal is. So at this point in time, I think um, given that we're at this, I'll turn it over to um, staff. I drew here is from the engineering. Um, if you have any questions when we come up to the deliberations, um, Drew is here and Denver Brooker from Vocon. Our architect is here if we have some questions for them. I think it'd be better for them to respond to actual questions and what we're doing than necessarily to keep on talking and saying the same thing I've been saying. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attendance. I appreciate all the people on Zoom and dealing with this new normal that we have. And, and I will say that it's been, um, you know, great working with the city. 
Uh, we have, uh, as an interesting note, if you're residents over there, you'll notice that the fire department, the police department are at the building. Um, we've offered that up to them and they started training there, nighttime and daytime training last week, or is it this week on Monday, Tuesday, and they're gonna be doing it every Monday and Tuesday for the next eight weeks. And we offered the building up so the fire department could in there and train dark, you know, it's dark with the lights off and they can do things, they can find people, they can do search and rescue uh, and a lot of other things. It was interesting, we met with the chief there this afternoon and he was describing the things they did and how excited the firefighters were to be able to get to train in a building like that because it's so rare. Um, and the police department starts next week. So I'll be in there doing, um, you know, hostage recovery, working through kitchens and buildings and dark rooms. And that's part of what we give back. I mean, part of the issue is instead of tearing down the building, if, if the depart, fire department and the police department and other local agencies can work together and train in there for a few months, that's great. If people want to go out and play golf on the course, that's great. Um, you know, I wouldn't encourage it too much because there is, you know, liability issue if you get hurt. But, and we also mean, we also purchased all the lawn mowing equipment. So as soon as we get this worked out, we'll start taking care of the property and maintaining it. We're not mowing the greens. We're not, it's just going to be basically cutting the grass so it doesn't become uh, an eyesore. Uh, until we start construction this summer. Um, but we did uh, purchase the equipment and it's there ready to go. It's looking like it might need to be mowed here in a couple of weeks, uh, given the way that it's grown so far this year. So thank you very much. Um, I look forward to the questions and your feedback. Thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh. Uh, again, as I described uh, initially, uh, we will proceed now and uh, to opening the public hearing. It will take a motion to do so. Uh, just uh, in terms of the taking the public comment, we'll give everybody an opportunity to provide comment. Uh, you'll be stepping forward to the podium to uh, offer your comment. We ask that you give us your name and your address, and uh, I'll be giving up to three minutes to uh, provide your uh, comments and concerns concerning the project. Uh, Tyler is going to be the uh, timekeeper here so that we, everybody is, has an equal chance for uh, providing their comment. Uh, with that, uh, I hear a motion to open the public I'll make a motion to open the public hearing. Support. Motion by Tyler, supported by Pat, to uh, open the public hearing. Uh, Tricia, if you could call the roll, please. Mark? Yes. Steve? Yes. Terry? Yes. Tyler? Yes. Pat? Yes. Tom? Yes. Scott? Yes. Motion carried, public hearing is open. And again, uh, if you, we're gonna start with this, uh, taking comment from those that are uh, on premise right now. There'll be an opportunity though, for those that are online to provide comment as well. Uh, so if, again, uh, first person that comes forward and give us your name and address and thank you. Like that? Very good. Th thanks. My name is Dennis Higgins. I live at 1225 Van Portfleet Avenue, Proud Walk Residence. Ms. Anderson, could we go to uh, aerial view of the whole area, please? And love to help out the public safety. That's fantastic. We're well served here at Walker and that's a great opportunity for them. Beautiful. So uh, I don't golf, but I would like to see it remain a park. But of course the city needs the revenue and there is a housing issue. Uh, my concern is in here, I math challenge, but we have about 75 or 80 homes. And even though we're dancing inside of the boundaries of the master plan, we're looking at about 280 homes when we include the multifamily and the single family in an area not much bigger than this here. And I think there's maybe, if you go straight north from here to here, maybe 150, 180 above there. Uh, 
one concern, it's, it's the density that I think is an issue because the density is out of character, I think, and kind of a disservice to the Walker residents because I think that Walker is best served by residents that have a stake in their community by home ownership. Prior to being a Walker resident about six years ago, I lived in an apartment for seven years. I hope they're doing okay, but it's not a big issue to me, frankly. Uh, so the density, another problem I see with that is then someday in the future, if they do open that up to those other neighborhoods, that changes the character of those neighborhoods and uh, the whole traffic patterns above that. So what I don't agree with is the density of the multifamily putting 280, when you add it all in, 280 homes in an area the same size as this. And I realize that there is a big market for residential. Hampton Lakes over here uh, has five vacancies coming up in June. So there's definitely a market for that. And my unofficial non-commissioned traffic study well, I, I do give, you know, Kimberly Horn a lot of credit for getting with the NDOT and looking at the historical time. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. Traffic's going to get worse, not better. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Don Van Wilde, and I live on uh, Lincoln Lawns Drive. Um, I've lived there for 54 years, and all that does is make me old. But anyway, I have a problem with the traffic. I feel that what we're doing is we're taking traffic problems from the development and dumping them down Lincoln Lawns Drive. And I don't wanna see that happen. Let's, they're having an, uh, you have an, uh, an entrance and an exit um, road going into the development where I, I think there's gonna be a light there. And why not just leave it at that? Why not just take Lincoln Lawns Drive out of the equation? You really don't need to dump traffic down there. Uh, other other uh, developments along the area, um, like Bayberry Point, they have a single entrance and exit without any problem. In fact, they don't even have a light and they seem to be getting along okay. So as far as the rest of the development is concerned, I, I, I don't really have a problem with it. I think the buildings are look attractive um, I think it's a good use of the land, uh, and I'd like to see that a lot better than I would something like over here across the street from, from the Myers on Wilson Avenue. Those buildings, quite frankly, are horrible, and uh, I don't want to see that across the street from us or in our neighborhood. So that's all I wanted to say. Good evening, everyone. My name is Frank Segalas. I live at 695 Lincoln Lawns. Been residents with my wife and family there for 30 years. Uh, we live directly across from the golf course. It's been a great place to live. And you see a lot of things I put on Facebook about keeping Walker green. And if you look at our logo, you don't see development there. You see green trees and things like that. So what we have a lot of problems with in our area is water. We have a lot of wetlands, uh, which are really swamps. And the way Lincoln was developed uh, because of the natural flow that has come through the neighborhood from the north, uh, we've experienced 
quite a bit of flooding in our yard. Scott Connor has been to our house, put a drain in probably about 15 to 20 years ago and through the neighborhood and recognizes what we're going to have. When we build more homes, it takes away the green space, the water to flow down. Our sewer, our, our sanitary could probably handle it, but the storm drains definitely are not. And that needs to be addressed. Um, along with Kent County Drain Commission, um, things need to be looked at a lot more carefully than just throwing some slides up about uh, how it could be proposed and it looks nice. Uh, that's, that's all fine. But the residents who are living there right now, and we know throughout the Standale area that we do have drainage problems because of the clay. And we need to look at that along with the traffic situation. Um, getting into the single family homes back there, these being public roads, uh, there will be a concern someday of getting through to Maple Row. Um, if that's not, there, there's access already off back of Sunset with a road, if you can see, but it ends right there at the golf course tree line. Uh, so there's a possibility of that coming in the future. None of this is written in stone and we don't have any written documents from a legal standpoint we're just looking at the zoning right now. We want that to be number one here. The front along Lake Michigan Drive is commercial. That's fine. You want to develop that? That's great. Uh, maybe if this isn't going to be zoned, you may want to talk to the city about buying the property and make it in a municipal Make it real simple, like the mines. Time. Marsha, my wife, is giving me her three minutes. Three minutes. So what we have there at the mines, we could do very simply in Walker. And I've already talked to Kent County, uh, in the parks. They say they don't have money. I know that Walker has a coffer. I've lived here for 30 years. I've seen the development. There's a 1% income tax on our residents. Anyone who works in Walker or lives in Walker is paying the 1%. We have property tax, business taxes, all this. And I'm not saying that Walker doesn't take care of us because we have excellent city services. I don't think anyone in West Michigan has anything better than we do in Walker. And we can appreciate that but we really need to take a look at the water problem. The, this, when I, I wanna say about 10 years ago after we had the drain put in our backyard, we had torrential rains and I was talking to Don who's our neighbor two doors down. We had water coming off the golf course and it went right across our yard. You could not see Lincoln lawns. The, the um, drain system could not handle it. And our drain in front of our house goes to the drain across the street and that one goes down. I think those need to be looked at. If the zoning goes through, the, the drain systems need to be looked at, not just these retention ponds, but we need to get the water out of there because there's a lot more homes going in. We're gonna have all these <coughs> houses and driveways preventing and then all this runoff going into this um, drain system where it's it's going to be overwhelming so please take a look at that from an engineering standpoint thank you sir thank you My name's Mike McKeon. I live at 601 Lincoln Lawns. I've been there 40 plus years now. And I gotta agree with Don about the road traffic. I mean, we, we got a really quiet neighborhood. We're lucky. 
And I'd hate to see another road get put in there, just uh, accommodate some housing. There's got to be a different way of doing it. And I got to agree with Frank, too, with the water. I put over 100 yards of between sand and black dirt in my backyard just to keep it from flooding every time it rains. So I got to agree that it's got to be looked at. And so does that road coming through the Lincoln Lawns. We don't need all that traffic there. It's a nice, quiet, peaceful neighborhood. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Rick Beldman. I live on uh, 801 Anita. Um, uh, of course, we'd all like to have a park, but I appreciate, you know, the um, the fact that you want to make it a nice, nice place with with low apartments. So, um, but um, the concern I have is is also with drainage. Um, um, I live on the northwest, or sorry, the northeast corner of the development, and there's some wetland there, and um, a lot of that flows right now through the golf course. So I'm kind of concerned if that gets blocked off, that might flood the northeast portion of that with some of the homes that are along in the hazelnut area um, and including my, my own property too. So that's just a concern I have. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Kim Helpman. I live at 529 Fairway Drive. And I'm not gonna to spend too much of my three minutes um, complimenting, but kudos on the development that you're doing. It's very attractive. I wouldn't hesitate to recommend anyone to rent or buy a home there. Um, when you mentioned amenities, I don't know if you're thinking about a playground or pool or anything, if you're looking at family. Um, I encourage you to use local contractors when possible because we like to keep the work and everything local. My concern is um, the traffic and not the amount of traffic, but the traffic flow. <clears throat> I thought with Lincoln Lawns aligning with Sunset Hills, the traffic light was going to be there, but evidently it's not. It's going to be further east. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would like to see more okay. of a presentation on the traffic and traffic flow, because now the way I understand it is you would go Lincoln Lawns and cut into where all the single or the multifamily apartments are to get to, I think you called it a spine road, and the spine road is going to have the traffic light at Lake Michigan. And I think that's kind of awkward asking all those people to go through the apartment complex area to get out to where the traffic light is. You could still access Lake Michigan from Lincoln Lawns, but you know, if you wanted to turn left, it makes sense to go to a traffic light. So that's a concern of mine. So I'd really like to see more on the traffic flow. The other thing is, I'm not a fan of roundabouts. I understand roundabouts. Roundabouts are designed for places that are high traffic flow, places that you don't really want a traffic light, but need more than four-way stops. Roundabouts are designed so when accidents occur at those intersections, there's less harm done to people and vehicles. Roundabouts are not for residential areas, period. Roundabouts, in my mind, in a residential area, it's gonna be more of a hindrance than anything else. It's gonna be a hindrance for the people that are plowing the snow off the roads. It's gonna be a hindrance for school bus drivers. And I would really like to see this not have any roundabouts. Thank you.
Anyone else that would wish to come forward? Thank you. Jim Heidinger, uh, Lincoln Lawns Drive. I live by Don. And I'm also concerned with the traffic coming down Lincoln Lawns. Uh, you had the first one you had after when the first fella came up, it was a layout overview. I think if we can, uh, Lincoln Lawns is gonna take the blunt of all the traffic up and down. Trisha, can you just put the overall site plan up from yeah. either from our presentation or from the so what I'm proposing is that Lincoln Lawns is used fine to go north. Okay, when you go up here and stuff up Lincoln Lawns and it turns into Marlboro going the other way. Can you put a stop there from going south, make Marlboro a one way going west, so we defer some of the traffic coming back down those other roads rather than Lincoln Lawns taking the whole front and just leave Lincoln Lawns the way it is? Traffic's fine that way, but if we dump all the traffic back on the Lincoln Lawns going north and going south, that's the busiest spot in the whole plan. We don't have a problem with what you're building, just Lincoln Lawns traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Is that traffic one back on? Was that on your site map today on, on, on the Walker site? The traffic one? I guess I didn't go enough pages. I did about 20 something pages to look and I didn't see the traffic one. That, that slide was from my presentation. So that wasn't on the site today. So this is just all surprise to all of us, right? Don't start my time yet, please. Okay, so can you tell me how this is, is you said the traffic person was here, right? Yeah, that, well, I can. Can you, can you, so this is, this is closed. So this is closed and the only way in and out is through the roundabout, right? At the park? Is that correct? Yeah, that would be aligned to the, the access on Lake Michigan Drive there at Sunset Hill. Sunset Hills is this access? Yes. What's all this? That's the commercial development. Where's Lake Michigan Drive, right here? Yes. So Sunset Hills is more over here though, isn't it? No, it's right there where the new access point would align with Sunset. Right here? Yes. So this is gonna be a light right here? No. It's just the, the new realignment. The signal will be at the proposed spot entrance to the development. So the spine road, that's your spine road. So this, this here is in and out at your own risk. And then you're gonna take all the housing from the north and you're doing this roundabout, you're closing Lincoln off, Lincoln lawns off at the park and all the residents have to come through here if you wanna turn right. If you wanna turn left, you gotta go through the apartments, the office buildings, the retail and come out here. Is that what we're saying? So how's that gonna, how's that help our residential? Ma'am, uh, you, you've you raised your point that you have a concern about the, the flow of the traffic there. Absolutely. Is there anything else that- <laughs> But first is, I understand what you did because I was looking, my, doing my homework, trying to see what the site plan was and none of us knew this. So I guess we have the right to you know, know before we ask the questions, right? So this, so everybody understands that, right? Okay, so I did some numbers. This is the residential reality, okay? For the office, 252 parking spaces. For building E, 35, building D, 51, building C, 37, building B, 62. These are retail buildings and office buildings. We have 437 car spaces. If there's a five, if there's a five time turnover rate, which you want retail, if you want to make money, then that's 2,100 cars a day. 600 from units, if we have total 300 units of apartments and houses, 300 units, if they each have two cars, that's 600 cars, add that 600 to the 2100, that's 2700 cars, and maybe 300 from our area, 
That's 3,000, 3,000 cars per day in the roundabout. Time. Okay. I know you don't want to listen to me, but. Time. Oh, wait a minute, five more minutes. Wait, no, wait a minute. Ma'am? Excuse me, ma'am. Okay, you've raised a question about the, the traffic circulation. Uh, you've made note of uh, what you projected to be the uh, um, traffic projection from this. What other point do you have to offer? About the cost. About the cost. Just ask, asking about cost for the, um, the units, the um, apartment units. Because in the MY, it said that the uh, monthly amount was $1,500 to $2,200 a month. Is that correct? Roughly. Roughly. So that's a, a mortgage of $300,000 a year. So that's that's the math too. That's the other math. And also between Maynard and all the way out to Grand Valley, all that's going to be developed into apartments and everything. So you got to keep that in mind too. So, but I totally against anything, just like the other gentleman and everybody said, Kim said, nothing on Lincoln Lawns. Absolutely no traffic on Lincoln Lawns. And the other thing is, you cannot bring any construction equipment on Lincoln Lawns, none at all. Because if you're talking this to be a three to four ma project. Ma'am, ma'am, uh, your request is that they uh, do not have construction equipment there. That you you have to state your concerns. You, you've stated your concerns. Uh, it's not stated in terms of an ultimatum and how it's addressed. Yeah, I I mean. You can provide your, your perspective on that. And uh, if I could get your name and address, Mr. please. I one Thank you. And um, we didn't get any information on, the only information we got was from you guys in December on the Zoom meeting. But we didn't get any information from Walker and the meetings or anything. Okay, so I appreciate at least the, you know, information from the school, okay? But it's about construction vehicles. We've had all kinds of construction mm -hmm. to the east of us, now it's gonna be, I mean, to the west of us, now it's gonna be east of us. You have to bring so much. We talk about swamp, the double dump trucks that all the fill. We can't have it on Lincoln Lawns. You gotta leave Lincoln Lawns alone. You gotta just go that main, your main uh, spine route and go that way. We can't have all that construction. You know, uh, all the trucks. Okay, <laughs> Chris, so, thank thank you very much. Thank that's you. That's my two concerns. Nothing on Lincoln Lawns. No construction vehicles on Lincoln Lawns. Thank I'm you sorry. for your comments. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to offer? Please. Um, my name is Ed Kowalski. I live at uh, 3608 Sunrise Lane um, up to the north. Can we get a picture of the whole proposed development? I'm also worried about the runoff. My house sets about eight feet lower than the flat plane of the golf course. I do have a drain in my backyard. Um, so it'd be natural for that water to come my way. It does act like a sponge. Um, I'd like to comment that you've done really well on your plan, um, addressing a lot of concerns that we did talk about in January on the meeting. Um, I'm probably about five lots in from the top of that page. And I see you've done really well with buffers around what is the golf course. Um, I would like to see in that residential across the top, maybe some buffer up that way. Um, that's where my concern is. I own a few of those uh, low to mid grade trees that you're proposing not to cut. So I, they could die, they could get cut, whatever. Um, but I would like to see that buffer come down a bit or some sort of buffer actually put in maybe a hundred feet, something like that. Um, I know it's possible. I work for a company who actually built here in Walker. And uh, what they did is they offered to the residents at a real reasonable price uh, property fee uh, to help build that buffer. And you're currently our neighbor. You own it, right? So um, that's what we want to talk about is let's be neighborly and uh, try to make things work. I see you made some great adjustments and you're, you're working at it. So I look forward to look, working with you is where I hope we're gonna go with this. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. At this point, we're going to, uh, Jason, if you could provide the instruction to those that are uh, in the audience uh, uh, on the Zoom as to how they can be recognized, and then we could call upon them as well. Yep. So if you're on the Zoom meeting, if you can raise your virtual hand, you'll see a hand in the lower part of your Zoom screen. I'm going to go down the list as you, you call it. I'm just going straight down the list. There's been a couple of people that have asked questions in the Q&A. I don't have the answers to your questions. So if you can raise your hand and ask that those questions to the people that can answer that, I'd appreciate that. The first person on the list is Sarah Sobel. And I apologize to anyone that I mispronounced their names. Give me one second. Okay, Sarah, you should be able to talk now. Yep, thank you. I'm Sarah Sobel. I'm at 865 Anita Avenue. So the north um, east corner right there with the wetlands between us. Um, I know that you said that you did this basic proposal and changed things with the just um, without <laughs> the only thing possible of not changing was that this development would not happen. And I just want to go on the record that we are not in favor of this development as far as we have much concerns with the traffic and also we feel that there would possibly be an increased rate of crime also in the neighborhood and um, we also appreciate the wetlands that are in our backyard and the amount of animals that we see on a daily basis and we just would hope that would continue. So I just want my concerns to be on the record. Thank you. Okay, next is Jared Van, is the last name? You can talk. Hello, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes, my name is Jared Van Dopp on the 881 Row. So uh, again, thanks to the developer, I see a lot of the changes that you made since the fall of the developer, uh, making the Zoom accessible and currently out of town, so I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to say bottom line up front, I guess my perspective is what kind of community do you um, and that's regarding the rental properties. That are here. Uh, I mean, there's some other things uh, I like to hit on, but that's first and foremost. If you start at the southeast corner of Lake Michigan, driving Wilson, we already have the brand new West Town and Wilson apartment complex, which everybody's aware of. It's a large apartment complex. Move further east, we have the Apple Ridge apartment complex, which is also very large on the south side of Lake Michigan Drive. We also have the Hampton, uh, yeah, Hampton Lakes apartments on the north side of the road. Go further east. East. Um, you have the Bayberry Point Apartments, uh, which just underwent a large expansion. And we now also have the city of Grand Rapids on the east side of Maynard, the north northeast corner of Lake Michigan Drive. Maynard has approved a new apartment complex over there. That leaves us with a very, very high density of apartment complexes along a very short stretch of the road. I don't think we need any more rental properties in this area. I think if we could look at this, maybe make the apartments uh, larger in condos instead, and maybe that would be a, a good uh, uh, middle ground, but I, I think we already have too high of a density of apartments in the area, and I don't want Standale to be known as basically central, uh, where we just have short-term renters coming in and leaving again. I would like to see uh, families coming in and, and investing in owning property I think it makes for a much better uh, community overall. And speaking to that, I think it partially ties back into some of the other people's concerns as far as density. Uh, if we make the units larger, we will make the homes a little larger as well to maybe cut down the overall number that would also cut down uh, at least somewhat on the traffic. Uh, I understand I'm a little bit hard to hear, so uh, I will that. that's my concern. Thank you. All the NIMBYs are talking. Is it good? Sorry, just background. Okay, next is Julie Hughes. You can talk. You have to unmute, unmute yourself. Okay, Julie, I'll come back to you. 
Next is Joey. You can talk. Uh, Joey, starts, last name starts with an O. Got it. Now can you hear me? Yes. Yep, thank you. We are on the northwest corner of the property up where the open area is going to be right along Westway, uh, where, where it curves down Westway and Marlboro meet. And we have heard already several people talk about the possibility of purchasing some some areas or land as a buffer zone. And um, we'd like that to be a consideration. Um, I know that uh, I have tried, I've contacted Mr. Rodriguez uh, several days ago and we had talked about that. So we, we just wanted that to be known if that's still, you know, to keep that option open, if that is something that they can do, because it does seem that there's a sidewalk planned right along to the north, um, that open area where we cut across right to the bike path uh, along the, along the west side of the property. And that, that, you know, that would be something that would, you know, hopefully they would take into consideration our house is right there. And that bike, that, that sidewalk could be like, you know, five or six feet. And I know it's a very personal issue as we all have on this, but uh, just something we want, you know, we would like to at least be considered if they don't do the, uh, consideration of a possible purchase than something along the lines of at least setting up a buffer so that the sidewalk might have a different entrance area to the uh, bicycle path. We and followed. yeah, I'm sorry. We followed. Oh. We followed lived here. Yeah. yeah. It seems like all the people that are talking to the people that have lived here for 30 something plus years. So, and that's, and we are one of those as well. And uh, we think the, the idea of the, 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 the concerns that have been addressed over the neighborhood meetings and so on are, are very, very well. And especially the idea of the terrain, keeping the terrain natural as possible and, uh, and do consider the drainage issues because even we in this Northwest corner, which is a, which is a uh, wetland area, we get a lot of standing water in our side yard and backyard when it gets a heavy rain, let, let alone a flood situation. So that's all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, next is Sarah S. You can talk. Uh, you have to unmute your mic. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so my name is Sarah Schuster. I live at 3535 Lake Michigan Drive, um, which in the plan is that little piece in the middle that's not in the development area. And I wanna thank Anthony for answering my many questions um, that I had after the November meeting. But I'll, re I'll ditto some of the concerns about traffic and drainage. Um, now that I see this plan, one of my concerns is there's traffic behind me and in front of me. We used to live in on Lake Michigan Drive, born and raised there, but now there's gonna be all this traffic behind connecting to Lincoln Lawns Drive, and that's the way they can get back there. So it redirects all of that traffic behind my house. Um, there's also a smaller buffer zone around those two houses, 35 foot versus along Lincoln Lawns Drive, it's 100 foot. So question about the narrowness of that compared to the homes along Lincoln Lawns Drive, which I think the 100 foot is great. And then one other question or observation, why is there no access off Lake Michigan Drive for the retail pieces? That would probably solve some of that access road into Lincoln Lawns Drive. So those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, next is Hendrix and Junos is the name. You can talk. Hi, thanks for having us on. Uh, my name is Gregory Juno, 670 Northway Drive. Um, it, just kind of reiterating some of the traffic concerns. You know, the hardest part right now of leaving Lincoln Lawns is trying to turn left on the Lake Michigan Drive. Um, that hill on Lake Michigan Drive makes it very difficult to see traffic. Even turning right, you've got traffic on you right away when you're pulling out. 
My concern is by lining that up with Sunset Hills, there's no opportunity to see traffic coming over that little hill. Um, I'm very concerned for me and my family's safety, trying to leave the neighborhood either left or right if that's not addressed. Um, additionally, we have some concerns about flooding, different things like that. You know, with the golf course gone, our backyard floods every year anyways. Um, I'm just concerned it's gonna get worse if something isn't done with the drainage. Um, there's no drain for the road in front of our house. We have giant puddles of water that just sit on our road currently as it is. Um, again, with the golf course gone, I'm just concerned that's gonna get worse for the neighborhood. So thanks for hearing my concerns. Thank you. Next is Bill Stalma. You can talk. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you for an opportunity to express my opinion. I'm Bill Stelema. I live 615 Lincoln Lawns. And uh, like my neighbors, I'm quite concerned about this connection uh, from the new neighborhood to Lincoln Lawns. Uh, first off, I don't feel it's necessary. Uh, most of the traffic is gonna use the spine road, especially if you put a traffic light there. Uh, so the, the additional connection is unnecessary. Secondly is um, Lincoln Lawns is a uh, closed neighborhood. And one of the reasons why we chose this area is because it's quiet and safe. Uh, at any given time, uh, any day of the week, uh, even in the winter, you can see people walking, biking, uh, kids on scooters with or without their parents, uh, walking their dogs, families walking with strollers up and down our street. And if you put an additional connection into our neighborhood, there may be some additional traffic that's gonna end up on our street that's gonna prohibit those type of activities. And those activities are what make our neighborhood such a quality place to live that make it safe and quiet. So I would, I would please uh, ask you to, to rethink that connection. Um, I don't think it's necessary and it's really going to disrupt our way of life here on this neighborhood. I realize that the, the, the development of the golf course is um, inevitable and we've come to terms with that, uh, but, but please rethink uh, this connection to our street um, to, to provide additional traffic, no matter how little that'll be. And that's all I need to say, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Julie H, you can talk. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. My name is Julie Hughes. I live at 850 Maple Row, right at the corner of Sunrise Lane and Maple Row. And I just want to say thank you so much for hearing our concerns on Maple Row about connecting the new development to our street. And I appreciate you keeping our kids safe and our neighborhood not becoming a through street um, from Lake Michigan Drive down to Leonard. So thank you. Your plans look great. I do understand other people's concerns, but I really, from our perspective over here on Maple Row, I'm very thankful that you did not connect the two um, developments. So thank you very much. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised. Once again, if you typed in a question to the Q&A section, I am unable to answer that. So if you could uh, ask your question. Um, if, you were, if you dialed in on a phone, I don't see anyone that did, but just in case I missed you, you star nine raises your hand and star six unmutes you. Now that's if you dialed in a number, not if you joined uh, via the Zoom app on your phone. Um, I see one more. Uh, Tom Moore, you can talk. Hi, this is Tom Moore, uh, 545 uh, Lincoln Lawns. I'm just curious uh, if uh, Walker is going to bury our uh, utility lines during the process of this development. Um. That's Thank you, Tom.
Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. All right, thank you, Jason. Uh, anyone else in the audience? Sir? Uh, Jim Comrie, 435 Lincoln Lawns. Um, I listened carefully when the um, lady from the uh, Northern Development had said, thank you for not putting a through street in. I would like to know how the decision was made that that, um, that connector to Maple Row was eliminated, but um, Lincoln Lawns was still gonna be used as a thoroughfare or the greater portion of Lincoln Lawns was gonna be used as a thoroughfare for the development um, at the back of the, uh, uh, the residential development at the back. Thank you, sir. We have a motion to close. Actually, one more person. Yeah, one here. more. Yeah. All right, Jason. Uh, Jim, you can talk. Good evening, my name is Jim Jarosh. I live at 704 Commer Court on the Grand Rapids side of the golf course. Many people have brought up the idea of that cul-de-sac over there. A cul, or not a cul-de-sac, a um, roundabout. The roundabout is made for traffic patterns. That traffic over there, everybody is correct, will greatly increase and that's why they needed the second exit. The site plan is overly dense. Otherwise, they would have only one exit in and one exit out, just like the next door uh, apartments, Bayberry. So continue to think about that, people. Um, also, wetlands. I'm sure anybody who's golfed at Lincoln or has been on that course, the south east corner where they had to eliminate some holes was not underwater until a couple of years ago it was always a golf course if we have any more of these major rains that we've had in recent history with the new runoffs i don't believe storms will be able to handle it and i think you're just looking for trouble to come over lake michigan drive or to go somewhere else onto this current property. But if things need to be done, you guys have made it much more likable, but I still like the oldest idea that if you want to have a uh, neighborhood that stays there, condos in the middle, surrounded by a nine hole golf course, keeps the green area, gets some money flowing in, and neighbors may be much happier with that decision. That's about all I have to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. A uh, motion by Mark to close the public hearing. Support. Supported by Pat. Uh, Tricia, if you could call the roll call, please. Mark? Yes. Steve? Yes. Terry? Yes. Tyler? Yes. Pat? Yes. Tom? Yes. Scott? Yes. Terry, the public hearing is now closed. This point, Terry, your mic. Okay, the public hearing is closed. At this point, uh, if ma'am, uh, ma if, if there's going to be some conversation, could you take it outside of the room, please? Could you take the conversation? The meeting will continue. Uh, appreciate your uh, bringing your discussion outside. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now uh, turn this over to uh, uh, the planning director, Tricia Anderson, to give her uh, an overview of the zoning perspective on this project, uh, the planning perspective on this project. I'm trying to share my screen. No 
back to the beginning here. So my name is Trisha Anderson. I'm the planning director for City of Walker. Um, it's nice to see um, a lot of people that I've talked to on the phone um, or, or shared some emails with in person tonight. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, give my whole 25 slide presentation because I feel like um, a lot of these topics have been discussed. Uh, the planning commission has my staff report. Um, the people have heard from the developer and what's being proposed. So I'm going to try to focus a little bit on process um, and how we, um, how this whole thing works. Um, so this is, these are obviously the existing conditions. And as Terry mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Chair mentioned um, at the beginning of the meeting, there are two requests being asked for here. The first one is the rezone request. And this is the piece where they're asking for the, um, the zoning to change from AA agricultural to um, RPUD one, which is low density residential, RPUD two, which is high density residential, and CPUD, which is um, commercial. And PUD stands for planned unit development. And so the planning commission is tasked with um, making a recommendation to the city commission for uh, final approval. Um, and then they've also asked us to review the PASP, which is the preliminary area site plan. So uh, a lot of the issues that are being brought up, um, very valid uh, questions and comments, um, kind of come at um, a later time um, when we look at more detail. The, the PASP is sort of a broad review of the entire project. Um, and because they're asking for three different zoning districts, um, each, each one has um, a few different requirements that are in addition to all the, all the requirements per the ordinance um, as far as site plan elements um, to be incorporated with the PASP. So um, Rick talked about this um, and how um, this is the portion that's proposed as a uh, single family, and then we've got multifamily here, and then commercial here. So I'll talk a little bit in a couple minutes about um, the uses that are being proposed in the commercial area. Um, and so since I've been, um, since we've started this process, this kind of began probably, uh, well, began before my time at the city of Walker. I started in February of last year. And um, it's my understanding that an application was submitted back in November of 2019. And um, shortly thereafter, COVID hit and we had to push off this public hearing for a really, really long time. Um, but I think a lot of the neighbors have always known that this was in the hopper and um, people um, have been expressing their concerns over the past year um, because we've had a, a lot of different, um, as Rick mentioned, um, revisions to the plan that we've, that we've re reviewed. People have stopped in to see what the latest plan is. Um, and, and we've gotten a lot of comments over the last year and especially tonight, we've gotten um, a significant amount of comments. And when we're compiling all these comments and concerns, um, you know, most of them relate to the increased traffic and the connections to the existing streets and safety. Um, whether or not the golf course will be maintained while before it gets developed or actually um, constructed, trees, a um, lot of a lot of comments about trees and how um, some of those old growth mature trees are very near and dear to to them and their their property. Um, 
some concerns about the rental and the transient nature of rental properties. A lot of people are concerned with wild ha wildlife habitat being lost. Um, and a big one is increased stormwater runoff. And I've heard a lot of, is this already a done deal? Um, so I'm gonna start with, with that one. Um, like I said, I was gonna focus a little bit on process here. Um, no, it's not a done deal. <laughs> um, this is actually the very first step. So the, the first step is for um, the developer to, to submit an application for a rezone. Um, and, and with that rezone, they have to give us a plan because the city can't just approve a rezone unless we know what you're proposing in terms of land use and density, compatibility, um, and all, all of that stuff. So the rezone, like I said, um, requires city commission. They, they have two readings of the rezone. So after this meeting, based on um, the planning commission's uh, recommendation, uh, they will have um, an agenda spot on the city commission agenda. And then at a subsequent uh, city commission meeting, they'll have a second reading. And if the city commission approves the rezoning, and remember we have three different zone districts that they're asking for, um, then we're gonna reconvene over here at the planning commission again, and uh, consider the planning commission is going to consider the the approval of the P, the PASP. So that's just the first set of steps in a really lengthy, um, branched, convoluted uh, process here. So if the PASP gets approved, let's say the rezone gets approved. If it doesn't get approved, then we're not going to come back here and talk about more uh, the PASP unless some other circumstances come up to where it would be feasible. Um, if it is approved, the next step is for, um, I believe the multifamily would be the first phase because that's kind of like their gig. Um, the single family, they would sell off to a local builder as Rick mentioned and depending on what type of subdivision tool that um, that local builder would like to use to subdivide up the property and create all those individual lots. That's another set of um, reviews and approvals and planning commission meetings, city commission meetings. If they, if they ask for um, a plat, that process is under the jurisdiction of the state and the, um, the, um, the county drain commission has jurisdiction over the stormwater management. And so that's another like really convoluted, planning is really kind of an old process, but people still use it. Um, but it's like, it's, it's like a five-step process and it takes a few years for it to get complete. Um, and then uh, the multifamily is probably, um, the easiest portion where they come back to the planning commission for what is called a um, FASP or a final area site plan. And that's just basically site plan approval. Um, so the planning commission has final approval or final say on, on um, that component. As far as the commercial goes, um, I heard some concerns with uh, the, the number of uh, cars that would be generated from those commercial lots. So the layout that's shown um, on, on the plan, again, is, is the, the PASP, or the broad view. Once you get down to um, an individual developer purchasing those individual commercial, what we call outlots, they have to come in individually and um, apply for a site plan approval through the planning commission. Um, and the uses aren't known yet with the exception of they proposed a C1 commercial, which is like neighborhood commercial, retail, small scale um, commercial. 
and um, office research and parking. So that's like medical buildings, um, uh, parking areas, which I, I doubt it would go as, but, um, and um, offices. So the uses are nailed down, but the sites are not set in stone because the um, parking calculations are based on specific uses. So it's, it's a general layout. And um, once they come in for the FASP, if, you know, if, this, if these other steps get approved, um, we look at all the fine details of the, that site at that time. So once again, it's not a done deal. It's where this is the first step in, in this whole process. So focusing on um, the, the piece that has to get approved before they can go further with PASP approval is the rezone. So what are the things that we look at when, um, when, when, we, uh, when, when the Planning Commission approves or denies a rezone request? So a, a few of the criteria that they are, or the boxes that they're checking here is, is, is the um, proposed zoning consistent with the master plan? The master plan is this, you know, large document that has all the goals and visions for land use and zoning for the city of Walker. Um, not only does it contain um, zoning and land use, but it also talks about utilities and road connections and um, preservation areas. And so that's the biggest thing. That's the first thing we look at. That's the first box we check. The second is, um, is, the, is the proposed land use that's associated with the, with the zoning that's being requested, is it compatible with the surrounding um, land uses? Um, and then with, the commercial, I mentioned that they're asking for a couple different uses, C1 and ORP. Um, with those two zoning districts, there's a range of uses. Um, so are the range of uses compatible uh, with the surrounding area? Health, safety, and welfare. Um, that's definitely a big box that we, that we look at. Spot zoning, are, are we being asked to rezone a piece of property to accommodate a use or is it consistent with the master plan? Um, and then we also look at, hey, can this, can this piece of property uh, support land uses that are permitted under the existing zoning? Um, can it be reasonably can it be reasonably used without having to be rezoned? And can the uses that are being proposed, can they be instead offered as a special exception use or a special land use permit um, without having to rezone? So these are all things that we look at um, when a rezone request comes in. So the first thing um, with with the rezone requests, the box that we check is consistency with the master plan. Um, the master plan is not a law, but it's more like um, a guide. And um, it's, it's got recommendations. It doesn't have rules, but it has recommendations. And um, this property has uh, future land use um, and community, uh, community character designation of residential growth, two to four units per acre, residential growth, four to eight units per acre, and neighborhood node, which is commercial. So the area is broken up on, in the master plan, the future land use designation um, map. Does it have to align exactly? No, um, but it should align uh, generally. And so with the proposed PASP in terms of staff analysis, um, the, the plan generally meets the, the recommendations for general characteristics, land use streets, building and site design and density. So another part of our master plan is the significant undeveloped lots. 
um, section. The recent update in our master plan um, has a section where we, we took an inventory of all these giant pieces of land that we know will probably get developed someday. Um, and so we've kind of given uh, a, a pre-prescribed uh, density maximum for each of these units or each of these um, big pieces of land. So this piece in particular, it, uh, we've prescribed as a maximum um, for, for non-cluster um, at 318.72 units. This particular development is proposing 281 units total, and that's with 67 single family and 214 multifamily. So we can check that box. Um, another piece to this is the corridor design plan. Um, the corridor design plan in the master plan shows um, connections to other neighborhoods and specifically via Maple Row and um, Cooster. And I never know if I'm saying the name of that street right. Um, and so when we look at the proposed PASP, um, not all these connections are provided. So here's a better look at the corridor design plan um, with the uh, yellow areas highlighted that represent um, future connections or future roads on this particular piece of property. So these, uh, so neighborhood streets were master planned to connect future development of Lincoln Country Club with the neighborhoods to the west and the north. Um, right now they're proposing to um, set aside some right of, right of way for potentially a future connection to Maple Row, but there's no connection proposed at this time. And then connection to uh, Cooster is not proposed at all. Um, but there, there is a connection to Lincoln Lawns Drive, which is in our corridor design plan. So I don't need to go through um, all of these because Rick did a good job of kind of laying out um, what all was being proposed here. Um, so, you know, I was going to talk about all of these things, but we pretty much covered them. Um, you know, they they did have a traffic impact study. Are we finished going through that whole document? I doubt it. Um, we're just at the broad uh, review of this. And Scott, our city engineer, is going to talk way more about streets and traffic than than I will. Um, but what I can tell you is that the, the, the rerouting Lincoln Lawns Drive, in staff's opinion, does solve some of the safety issues with having those two drives that are not aligned. Um, it's not ideal for the folks that live on, um, on Lincoln Lawns. Um, and I, I have a, a six and an eight-year-old, so I totally get the whole riding scooters and um, pushing strollers and riding bikes and, you know, having your own um, sort of your own private Idaho with the golf course there. Um, but it's a public street. And I think Scott's going to elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, so we talked about this road reconfiguration plan. I'm not going to spend too much more time on this. Um, folks who have been um, having concerns with safety um, you know, I believe that this signal would solve um, some of those concerns with, with taking a left out onto Lake Michigan Drive with that hill further to the east. Um, just highlighting some of these connections here. Um, no connection being proposed here. Um, I'm also going to highlight um, the the twenty foot buffer that there or no no clearing zone um, that they're proposing along the rear yards of um, the single family and then along um, the north south line here of the single family. Um, I don't 
I've, I've had um, some discussions with a couple people about trees right here, um, where, where um, Maple Row dead ends into the golf course property. And so there is some real concern about saving a very, very large oak tree right there. So I just wanted to get that out. Um, and Rick's gone through all of these. And, um, you know, this thing has been a, a year in the making and we wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time to allow all the public who wanted to comment on this project um, have their three minutes at the podium. And um, so that's why we're, staff is making the recommendation for the planning commission um, to consider the rezone request tonight and uh, table any action on the PASP until such time that the city commission has already gone through their first and second reading of the rezone request. Um, as far as the rezone is concerned in terms of master plan, um, land use compatibility um, and uh, all the other boxes that I mentioned that we'd like to check in terms of um, considering rezone. Um, it's staff's recommendation that the a planning commission forward a favorable recommendation to the city commission for the rezoning of the parcels associated with the Waterford Village project based on the findings listed in the planning director staff report. And that's it. Thank you, Tricia. And we now turn to Scott Connors, the city engineer. This is a good case of last but least. Um, as, as Tricia pointed out, um, this is really more about the rezoning. If we do move past rezoning, you get to the preliminary area site plan, which is where you start to get into some detail. That's not even the end of the detail. Then there's the final area site plan for each land use. And that's where we work with them to help make sure that all the problems are solved. So my report's gonna be brief and that's good because we all need to wrap this up and, and get to the planning commission uh, deliberation. So uh, very briefly, um, we've been through this plan a number of times. I think COVID has given uh, these folks uh, the opportunity to come back to us numerous times before this meeting and work through a lot of technical issues, um, probably more technical issues than I would ever imagine on a project of this size at this stage. So um, from an engineering standpoint, a lot of things are in good shape. There's still a lot of things to work through. Um, some notable things, uh, the Maple Row Avenue uh, access to the north uh, was something that was proposed initially. It's something that's in the master plan. Uh, in this uh, derivation of the plan, it's, it's been eliminated. I think it's important to point out that the neighborhood to the north does have redundant access. They have a good grid system, multiple ways in and out. That's what we need. Um, so it's not the end of the world for them if they're not connected. Um, but I think when you look at the Lincoln Lawns neighborhood and this proposed development, they're each on a single drive. Um, which is uh, against our code. You know, we require uh, anything over 800 feet to have redundant access, which to us is basically like a single phase plat with maybe 20, 25 homes. Once you get past that, we want to make sure there's a second way in and out for emergencies, for routine maintenance, for turning around trailers and motorhomes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it, it got a little bit more important uh, to the south. Um, there is a pedestrian connection to the north. And then as was noted, the utilities will still go through, but I would not expect that there'd be any point in time where we'd go back and make that connection. Uh, history would tell us that that's just not a favorable thing to do and there's nobody to pay for it. So that's, it's difficult to do. Um, so this development is proposed to have a primary public road that we've, we've talked about as kind of a spine to this development. Um, a traffic signal is warranted for that at Lake Michigan Drive. Um, that becomes very important because I think as we talk about how this is connected to Lincoln Lawns, we want to minimize uh, new traffic going into that existing neighborhood as much as we can. Um, and, and the way that this is shown, there would be cross access on the north end, but it's not designed in a way that would be a shortcut. It's designed in a way that would make it longer to go through there, which is good because then the Lincoln Lawns folks have the opportunity to go through on this public road system and have alternate access or redundant access there as well 
when again, a tree falls in the street or there's a road resurfacing or a water main break or a, a neighborhood uh, wedding or who, you know, all, any number of things that goes on in, in a neighborhood like this, uh, just to provide an alternate. I, the, the parade is another good example. We get a lot of complaints about uh, it's so hard to get in and out of here. And now you're going to throw a parade in front and we, you know, we have no way, uh, no other way in and out. And, and those are things that we have to think about when we're doing the, the early planning for developments like this. Um, so there's also a secondary, uh, in addition to the Marlboro and Lincoln Lawns intersection being connected, um, they have redundant access built in at the front uh, through the commercial development. I think that's another way to help the folks that are on the south end of Lincoln Lawns neighborhood with a, a way to get to that signal. Um, I do think that we have a little bit of work to do when it comes to you know, how that entrance is configured. And we've talked about that at our last meeting. Um, not everybody loves roundabouts. Some people love them. Some people hate them. Um, it's really a love or hate thing. And, and I think we need to, if this moves forward, we need to take a, another good look at that. Um, most importantly, looking at the three homes that would be south of the roundabout that are very close to Lake Michigan Drive now, making sure that uh, they still have good access. They can still turn around garbage trucks, boats and things like that are all still uh, you know, easy to configure through there. Um, so there's a little bit of work to do and some refinement there if this moves forward. There have been a lot of comments about drainage. Um, that's no surprise that this golf course has very, very bad drainage. Um, I know I've spent a lot of time out here over the years, both uh, professionally and personally, and, um, and watched, this, uh, watched some areas um, really fail in terms of um, drainage. A lot of that is related to an old uh, drain system uh, that runs along the south side of the property uh, that's part of the county drain. It's very deep, it's very old, it's in bad shape. And I think as part of this development, one of the good things is that that would be replaced and reconfigured and cleaned up. So some of the, some of the holes, uh, and I, I, not, I don't mean hole in terms of golf, but hole in terms of a low area or depression, uh, a lot of those areas that are inundated in the spring can be fixed. And I think that's a really good thing. And it, it'll have to be fixed in order to promote any kind of development in there. Um, a lot of that work will come under the purview of the Kent County Road or Kent County Drain Commission, but you know we certainly play a very active role in that and, and uh, even more active on the rest of the site. And then our, our last issue really is uh, not even an issue. I think there's probably two people in this room or in this call, Drew and myself, that really care about it, but public water and sewer, uh, the stuff that's underground that's hidden, um, I think they're in very good shape there. We have done some work with Grand Rapids and the capacity does exist. They'll have looping of the water main, which is good for firefighting and, and for uh, cleaning out the lines and redundancy. Uh, so I think all those things are, are feasible at this point. That's really all we, need, we can tell you is it's yes, it's feasible. We'll work out the details later, um, but they're a step ahead where we'd expect to be with a good layout and already having some review um, with Grand Rapids. So that's kind of a quick mile high view from engineering. Thank you, Scott. Um, at this point, uh, this is an opportunity for the commission to deliberate on the information. We've had the uh, presentation by the developer. We've heard uh, uh, comments from the community, both those who were present this evening and those that are uh, uh, on a Zoom call. Um, and we've also gotten a, a, an overview. Uh, we've had the staff reports in advance from the, uh, our city engineer, as well as the planning director. Uh, they were also able to uh, add some additional comments that uh, I think relate a lot to the points that have been raised by the uh, community this evening. And it's a lot of information to take in it into account. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, there's two things that we're, we're looking at here is the rezoning and also a recommendation to the city commission on the preliminary area site plan. Uh, personally, with respect to the uh, comments that have been offered this evening and even the developer's presentation, it's raised a lot of questions in my mind as far as how we deal with that site plan layout. Uh, I think some very good points have been made uh, in that respect. It's my suggestion as we deliberate here is that we focus on a rezoning this evening and uh, offer a recommendation to the city commission on the rezoning. 
and hold off on taking action on the preliminary uh, area site plan to take to fully take into account the comments that have been made. There have been good points raised, and uh, I think again uh, uh, this, throughout this evening. And uh, to do it justice, I think we want to take take some time to take that into account. But I think it is imperative that we uh, uh, take that first step and and take deliberate on the rezoning request. And uh, I guess with that introduction there, uh, I'd, I'd like to get comments from the other commissioners as far as where you feel we are with respect to the rezoning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, yep, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in favor of the rezoning. Um, uh, I think uh, it's been, been well thought out. I mean, this, this piece of property has been up for sale for well over 20 years. Um, it's been, you know, a golf course that's really not been a golf course. North of this course, I get water in my yard all the time. So I know that will be taken care of. Um, and I, so I'm looking forward to it because I am tired of all the water as all the neighbors are. So I know that will be addressed because that's part of, of the requirement. Um, I think the light will actually help because if you can imagine traffic stopping at that light, so you now can get out of Lincoln Lawns or the, the other exit, because right now, you know, you've got tons of traffic flying up and down that street at 60 miles an hour, a light is gonna slow it down and stop it, give you those exit times to get out where you don't have them today. So I think it, it will be a benefit. Again, there'll be some more traffic, I agree, um, but with new development, you get new, more traffic. But so with that point, um, I am in favor of, of taking the course and putting it into the, uh, the new uh, um, PUD one, PUD two and commercial. Okay, thank you, Pat. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Tom. I would uh, agree with Pat's comments. I think the rezone is appropriate. I understand the neighbor's concerns. Um, we also have to address public safety, as Pat mentioned. And I'm confident the staff will take care of the drainage and all those issues. Uh, the plans, um, I can draw straight lines with the best of them. And I that what street layout is. I would have to vote no on that tonight, but I I will vote yes for the rezone. Okay, thank you, Tom. Mr. Chair, I would echo both Tom and Pat's not to not to go rehashing them. Uh, just as far as the PSP for your uh, benefit. Uh, well, to answer the one thing, the density people have said the density is too much too high. Well, they could have. We could, uh, we could put it into our PUD and put 400 units, units in there, right up to the lot lines, right right up to the lot lines. Yeah. We could do that. They could do that. Could sure, sure. So, uh, but I'm just saying it could be 400 units instead of 250. Ma'am, ma'am. I'm making my comments now. You had your chance. Thank you. As far as traffic, the traffic light will help a lot. As far as uh, Lincoln Lawns, um, I'm not sure about the way it's designed. I do agree with the redundancy of access up on Marlboro. That's just civil engineering. Uh, I don't know what else to say that about that, but I, I disagree with not hooking up Maple Road. That road was put in there to hook up. There's a stub there. It was planned that way. This is what we were supposed to be doing. So uh, other than that, there's apartments in the area, the apartments match the apartments, the houses match the houses, there's light commercial there, there's not going to be heavy industrial. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. It's like it's my turn. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think the neighbors have brought up a lot of really good points in terms of traffic, things like that drainage, and those are the issues that we'll work through in a uh, preliminary area site plan review, final area site plan review, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, as it pertains to the rezoning, um, I'm not opposed to the project concept, right? A lot of folks have said that this in concept is not a bad thing. The development is not bad. The, a lot of elements are good. Residential is good. Now, from my perspective, as I review the master plan, I see it a little bit differently than maybe some of the others. And I'm looking at um, as someone that was a part of that process, 
my intent when we were approving this uh, SUD development concept. Um, and I look at the shape of the two uh, parts of that zoning district that we had put in there uh, as we designated kind of the intent, right? And I, I see, and I remember these discussions where we had talked about the uh, six to eight unit density being kind of secluded to that pocket on the east side of this, this new spine road. Uh, and I remember having the discussions about keeping more of the single family abutting to the neighborhood. And, and that's kind of where I come in. And from my perspective, uh, I'd, I'd like to see more of that mirrored in, in the way that we're rezoning and in the plan. I understand that there's some density left there from the perspective of the overall site, but in terms of the actual way we're rezoning and developing, I'd, I'd I'm probably in, I'm at, well, at this point, I'm a no on the rezoning just because I would like to see that uh, four to, or two to four density abutting the existing neighborhood. And then maybe more of that four to eight secluded to the east side of that spine road. Now I could talk about maybe moving that spine road in a little bit as you get into the development, but and so that you could get more of that housing along the, along the parallel to the road, I should say. Um, but from my perspective, I just remember those discussions and I guess the way that I had envisioned it, um, we were doing a little better job of buffering that neighborhood with, with a more similar use between uh, the apartment or higher density uh, development to the actual existing neighborhood. Um, so that's kind of where I land on that. Um, a couple of other comments, um, the, the connection to Maple Rose mentioned uh, one thing I've brought up, I brought up at some point in the past, and I don't know which developers I was talking to or who, who it was at that point, um, but, and I'll just bring this concept up again, that northerly most road, um, the idea that I had had, because I, I worry about that Custerer road, uh, Custerer, that doesn't have that secondary access. Um, in my mind, the ideal configuration would be to use just that north road connect that to Custerer and to Maple Row, separate it from this new development and have the uh, Lincoln development connect to the east into the new development. So it wasn't, so you don't have that north-south connectivity, but you can get through between the neighborhoods if you needed that access at some point. Um, but it wouldn't be a use that you would go to for better traffic flow. It would be need only really. Um, so that was just a thought. It's not something that I'm attached to emotionally, but it's just something that I've thought of because I, I worry about that customer cul-de-sac ending after a very long uh, distance from the only access it has. Um, I'm trying, I, I, have, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I question the uh, location of the signal being on the east side of that commercial section. My thinking is you would want it at Sunset Hills where we've got something on the other side of the road. Um, again, not something that's tremendously life or death to me, but um, that, that's where it makes more sense to me right now. I know that someday there could be something on the other side of that road, but we've talked about not knowing when that could be 20, 40, 50, maybe never. Um, so that's just a thought. Um, a couple of the comments that we got, I wanted to quickly respond to um, it, as it pertains to drainage, just again, for everyone's information, that's something that we really dig into at the final area site plan. Uh, we pay very close attention and we're very, very sensitive to the impacts that any development may have on other properties as it pertains to water. So that's something that will be uh, the primary focus as we do that. Um, the, the comment on uh, purchasing the property, I'm happy to talk about that offline. I sit on the finance committee for the city. So um, I, I would say that that is probably not in the uh, reasonable realm of expenditures for the size of the city's budget. But again, happy to talk about that offline. Um, the roundabout, I would be inclined to say that a four-way stop may make more sense just because we're not gonna be pushing quite the amount of traffic that I, you would expect to need a roundabout. So I think a four-way stop could I guess help ease some of that concern and make sure it's safe and everyone can get in and out and with with it just being that residential neighborhood traffic. Um, yeah. And I think that is about all I had to say. 
Mr. Chair. Thank you, Steve. I don't think I can add a whole lot more than what Steve, I might be able to disagree with some of his points, but I think the, um, the um, this plant planner fits the master plan and is ready to go to the city commission for, to, uh, for approval. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, uh, I would uh, in tonight be uh, in favor of the rezone request. So um, uh, just to kind of put that out there, um, just a couple of other points regarding the plan itself. Um, there's a lot of questions and a lot of things that still need to be worked out, of course. Um, I agree with, uh, with uh, Steve regarding the placement of the uh, signal on Lake Michigan Drive. I think it would make more sense to place it at uh, Sunset Hills location. And uh, uh, I, I would also just like to point out too, I, I, I know a lot of our uh, citizens came out tonight to speak to the, in the Lincoln Lawns neighborhood came to speak regarding the, you know, quietness and, and the fact that they appreciate the one way in, one way out of their neighborhood, but there's there's a lot of homes back there. And just from a uh, safety standpoint, uh, like the city engineer also said, it, it just needs to be, uh, you know, multiple ways in, mul multiple ways out. And so um, I don't know what the best way to, to fix that would be, but I just like to, uh, you know, make those concerns of mine uh, put on the record tonight. So uh, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, and from, from my standpoint, uh, again, with respect to the proposed rezoning, I, I believe that the, as has been mentioned by the uh, fellow commissioners, that uh, in terms of the master plan, and, and again, we've just completed a, a long process of developing that, and a lot of thought was put into it, uh, taking public input from the community, and, uh, and the I believe that this development is by and large consistent with that. Um, now, some of the points that Steve uh, raised with regard to the, the uh, transition between uh, the Lincoln Lawns um, neighborhood and uh, the RPUD2 area uh, does give me pause. Um, and, and also his comments with regard to the interconnections with the neighborhood to the north. Um, uh, that that was evident. A lot of the comments we got from in the from the community this evening uh, concerning that, and I think that some of the suggestions he's made, I think, are are ones that we should really take into account as we look at that PASP. Uh, again, not deciding on it tonight because uh, again there was a lot of comment this evening, and I think if we focus in on the rezoning as we are with our comments right here. Uh, we can better um, take into account some of these uh, differing viewpoints and see if we can come up with something that would perhaps be uh, an improvement upon the plan that's been submitted uh, for review. Uh, uh, it's because inter that connectivity, uh, redundant access, uh, I think what it comes down to is a case where if there's an emergency, uh, where there is fire or police getting in there, uh, public works being able to uh, address a, a water main break um, and just uh, the flow of traffic between the neighborhoods. Uh, uh, I, I think it's very important that that is a, a, a major concern. That was a, a point that was raised in the master plan update, the importance of that. So I think we really have to take that to heart and also take into account the uh, comments this evening. So with that, um, do we have anyone that would be willing to offer a motion with regard to the rezoning request? Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion. Case number 20-875, Wadford Village CPUD, RPUD, and RPUD rezone of 3483 and 3485 Lake Michigan Drive Northwest from A to CPUD, RPUD 1, and RPUD 2. I make a motion to forward the recommendation of the city commission to approve the rezone of the parcels located at 3483 and 3485 Lake Michigan Drive Northwest from AA Agricultural to CPUD, RPUD and RPUD2 in accordance with the zoning exhibit provided by the applicant dated 
2021, based on the following. Uh, these are the findings of fact, or the property can be reasonably used under its present zoning, but it doesn't match the edge matching. So I would say this is probably right. The proposed uses are compatible with other zoning and land uses in the area. It would not be more appropriate to add the proposed use to the existing district as a permitted use or by special permit rather than allow a rezoning. The range of uses permitted in the proposed zoning districts are compatible with the area. Development trends in the area are consistent with the request for rezoning districts. Uses in the proposed zoning districts are equally or better suited to the area than those in the current zoning district. The proposed zoning is consistent with the city of Walker master plan. The proposed zoning does not constitute spot zoning. The proposed use can be adequately served by public water and sewer. The requested rezonings do not negatively affect the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Support. Okay, we have a motion by Tyler, supported by Pat, uh, to um, uh, forward a recommendation to the city commission for to approve uh, the proposed rezoning. Uh, Tricia, if you could call the roll, please. Mark. Yes. Steve. No. Yes. Tyler? Yes. Pat? Yes. Tom? Yes. Scott? Yes. All right, the motion carried in terms of offering a, a positive recommendation to the city commission. Um, that will go to the city commission. Uh, uh, Tricia, do you have any idea on the time frame? I saw on their timeline that they were expecting sometime in May. Yeah. Um, uh, the city commission meets um, every two weeks on the second and fourth Monday of the month. So May 10th would be the first city okay. commission meeting in May. Okay. Thanks, Steve. So uh, in, in this case, all the people that were notified of this hearing will likewise get a notification of the city commission hearing. So you'll have an opportunity again to come forward and offer your, your comments. Um, and they will have the benefit of the public record, the minutes of this meeting right here to, to hear the comments that have been made both by the developer and the, uh, the, uh, the citizens. And uh, we'll take it up from there. Uh, Mr. Chair, I make a motion to table the preliminary site plan for Waterford Village Development depend, uh, pending approval of rezoning. Support. Mark? Yes. Steve? Yes. Terry? Yes. Tyler? Yes. Pat? Yes. Tom? Yes. Scott? Yes. Okay, that motion carried. So we're gonna, uh, that's, that action will be tabled. Again, when that's brought back up for uh, reconsideration, there will be, again, public notice of that. And you'll uh, likewise be given an opportunity um, uh, as time goes on, uh, we may be seeing these hybrid type of uh, meetings. Um, I think ideally we'd get back to the full, um, public hearing in person, but, uh, I think we're, this is going to be the best we can do for the time being. Uh, so we appreciate your turning out both, uh, in person and also, uh, online this evening. And, uh, uh, in terms of commission, any other comments, uh, staff? Um, I don't have any additional comments. Um, this was a special meeting. So we have another meeting next week. Um, we have a site plan approval uh, for a proposed salon on Cummings. Um, other than that, um, I don't have a whole lot of other updates okay scott i make a motion we adjourn this meeting all right we got a motion Support. by scott supported by uh 
Tyler to close the meeting. Uh, um, Tricia, if you could just go through that, the roll call, please. Mark. Close the meeting. Close the meeting. Yes. Steve. Yes. Terry. Yes. Tyler. Yes. Pat. Yep. Tom. Yes. Scott. Yes, please. Okay, the meeting is now closed. Thank you very much. You all have iron bladders because I've had a thing.